um, housekeeping the loos are through the doors to the side of us and the emergency procedure um, in the event of an emergency the building must be evacuated um, and the meeting point is on the green adjacent to the Berries car park and the Crown Court car park. Um, so I'm going to start with informal public questions. Um, do I have any informal public questions, so please? Mr. Right, first of all, I know we have Mr. Bolton. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, a couple of questions. Firstly, parking in the lower part of Frith Hill Road and Chalk Road. At an earlier meeting of this committee, it was agreed to introduce some parking restrictions. There seemed to have been some delay. Can we have an update? And if I'm, shall I ask my uh, but second? We'll have, a, we'll have an answer to that because I think Thank we you. actually already have one. Um, Mr. Selby. Uh, Jack. 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 Oh, I'm sorry, Jack. <coughs> yes, good morning, everyone. Yes, the. Um, I wrote, I wrote an answer for this, so I'll, I'll, just, I'll just read it. Um, the, the agreed and advertised W lines for Frith Hill Road and Chalk Road are still due for installation, uh, but there has been a delay. Whilst most of the Frith Hill, Frith Hill Road's uh, lines have been installed, the most crucial part towards the bottom of the hill is still due to be finished, and Chalk Road has not yet been started. Uh, a bottleneck in ordering lines around the county, as well as the persistent wet weather since last autumn, has meant that many new parking review lines have not been completed as quickly as normal. Uh, there are several unfinished locations in Waverley, but also in other boroughs uh, in the county as a result of this. Uh, this is in addition to the usual persistent uh, parking problems seen where new restrictions are due. Uh, the current situation is that many outstanding lining locations in Waverley are due to be swept by the borough council uh, in advance of hopefully some out of hours visits by our lining gang now that the evenings are getting lighter. I apologise for the delay since these restrictions were agreed, but it should hopefully not be too much longer before everything is completed. And that applies to other locations in Godalming and Waverley too. Um, Mr Bolton, your second question, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Just to reply briefly to the answer, now that it is spring, let us hope for more progress. Uh, Charterhouse Road and Twycross Road Junction. There is a roundabout. Some members may be aware of this. It's on the main road from the A3 into Godalming. The roundabout can be misused by motorists disobeying normal rules of the road. We've had an on-site meeting recently with local residents, officers and members. Can we have an update on improvements to the roundabout and their timetable, please? Uh, Mr Selby. Yes, good morning. Uh, following the meeting with the Frith Hill Residents Association, Surrey Highways carried out a speed survey on the Hurtmore Road on the approach to the Twycross Road roundabout. The average speed was 32 miles an hour. Highway officers reported these findings to the police who are responsible for enforcing the local speed limits. The police suggested that the average speed was in the permitted tolerances <coughs> excuse me, and that it was not deemed a cause of concern and that the police would not be prioritising this site for enforcement. Some additional engineering measures were suggested during the site meeting, however funding to carry out the work has not yet been identified. It would be at the discretion of Councillor Penny Rivers whether she wished to prioritise the additional measures. Uh, thank you. I would remind people that if the average is 32, half the cars are going faster. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Do I have any other informal public questions? Mrs Ames. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mine is a question of the principles of this committee, uh, asking a question which has been um, submitted time and again to my certain knowledge. When, please, are we look, going to be looking at the review long promised of the terms of reference of this committee, and in particular, our interface with our neighbouring boroughs and counties and county principals, interfacing the Health and Wellbeing Board, uh, which has been promised for so long and still isn't on the agenda? I know it's not a detailed question in relation to the management of the, this committee today, 
but I am concerned. It would have been promised and promised and promised, and still there is nothing, in, in, not even on the agenda in the forward programme. And I hope that perhaps we might sort of uh, start talking to our wider principals and linking it in, in this very valuable committee, which is much respected by the public. It's one of the few where, if there is a local item, believe me, well, you know well enough that the public do turn out, and we really need to make the most advantage of that, and our links with the public as well. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Um, well, we're lucky to have Mr Kemp here, who is obviously Deputy Leader. He takes on the question, and Mr Harmer, who's Chairman of Overview and Scrutiny Committee. No, 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 no audit, audit, oh, sorry, Audit and Governance, governance which also <laughs> has some impact on these matters. Gentlemen. Hello, Mrs. Ames. Very nice to see you again. Thank you, sir. <laughs> um, so uh, we're, we're again reviewing. Obviously, as you as you very well aware, we have uh, looked to the local committees and to be transferred into joint committees over a while, and that work is still ongoing. We are having a, another review at the moment on looking at what we can do to to look at the work of these committees and how they how can, going forward how we can. I don't know, just look at different ways of making it more, more relevant um, locally and across the area. Obviously, we, you have the connection between here and your neighbours, which is Guildford, because obviously your senior highway officer looks after both areas, so there is some continuity. Getting all the councillors together in one room could be a quite an interesting uh, um, agenda. I wouldn't, don't think I'd want to chair that meeting. Um, but it, we, we're constantly looking at it, but it's actually you need to get the agreement of the people in the room if it's going to be a joint, you need the, 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 the borough on board as well. I mean, we, we've got a few, as you're very well aware, but we will keep looking at it and keep trying to work different ways of, um, of, of uh, adjusting it. If I could can go a bit further. Uh, <clears throat> at the moment, this committee is a committee of the County Council to which uh, certain powers are delegated and various other discussions can usefully take place. Uh, and the Waverley members are equal partners in that, from a sort of speaking and voting point of view, uh, but it is nevertheless subject to the uh, general rules of the County Council. The discussions that are taking place, uh, as Colin says, um, there are various possibilities that could go forward. At the moment, uh, several boroughs have gone for a joint committee of the county and the districts, and um, that, that uh, is of some interest to me because it was discussed when I was leader of Waverley a long, long time ago. And, it, and not, not in those terms, but the, the general objection was that Waverley wasn't happy to put uh, their decisions onto the table, so to speak, for the County Council to interfere with. Uh, moved, times have moved on and people are a bit more relaxed uh, around the place, particularly in some boroughs who found it very useful to go down that path. At the same time... Uh, so we could do that now because the, um, the rules of the County Council permit for that to be done if that was the wish of, uh, the, of Waverley and, uh, and the County Council to come together in that way. There's a separate discussion going on saying, well, actually, maybe things need to be wider than that. And, and this is a, a much more complicated discussion because it involves uh, other public bodies uh, and whether we would be able to uh, have, if you like, an amalgam of the interested parties almost, which were all in the public domain, uh, to uh, discuss pretty well any issue of public concern. And one can imagine that that would need quite a bit of thought, and, and that's why it's not an instant decision uh, from the County Council's point of view, or from any of the other parties, I suspect. <laughs> uh, so we're saying, why wouldn't you involve health, police, uh, all sorts of other, other bodies who have and if impact on our public uh, and uh, aren't here in these discussions, although we invite them in from time to time to come and tell us. So there are uh, serious discussions going on, and uh, we, I think it, probably it'll take a little while because the issues uh, of how to govern such arrangements are not straightforward. Uh, and uh, for, to some extent, we'll need to see what uh, moves the government makes uh, when things settle down a bit from a corona point of view. Uh, and uh, they, they may well have some views on how uh, local government in particular should be modified in its arrangements from where we are now. But we'll see. Thank you very much. Uh, now, gentlemen, 
Turt and Elf Frencham. Frencham Parish Councils. I believe you have a question. Or a statement. If you, sit, if say, sit, if you sit, just sit. turn on your microphone, sit, that's sit, it. Sit you say sitting, it's fine. Uh, Madam Chairman, it, it has been my intention to um, talk about a little bit of background in relation to one of the items on the agenda. I'm told that's not appropriate and that I cannot do so. There is another person here in connection with the same item who is going to be asking a question anyway. So I don't think, unless you allow okay, me to no. make a short statement, I don't think I can. Okay, no, that's perfect. Thank you very much. Right, do we have any other public questions? Good? No? Fine. In which point, case we shall press on with the main part of the um, agenda. Um, actually, first, before we go any further, could I just ask members to go around and introduce themselves? I think I've already said who I am. David Harmer, representing Waverley Western Villages. That's the countryside from far, the edge of Farnham in the west to Brook in the east. Uh, Colin Kemp, Deputy Leader, Surrey County Council, with portfolios for economic development and infrastructure. I'm Frank Capicella. I'm the Area Highway Manager for Guildford and Waverley. Adrian Selby, uh, Surrey Highways. I'm Nikki Barton. I'm County Councillor for Hazelmere and Gracewood. Carol Coburn, Waverley Councillor, Farnham Bourne. Christine Baker, Waverley Councillor for Milford. John Gray, Waverley Councillor for Dunsfold and Chenningfold. Jerry Iman, Waverley Councillor for Farnham Fergrove. Uh, Andy McLeod, Surrey Councillor for Farnham Central. Peter Martin, County Councillor for Godalming, South Milford and Whitley. Uh, Mark Merriweather, uh, Waverley Councillor for Farnham, Webb and Badshot Lee and Waverley Portfolio Holder for Finance Assets and Commercial. Andrew Povey, County Councillor for Cranley and Newhurst. Wyatt Ramsdale, uh, County Councillor for Farnham South. Stephen Sp Stephen Spence, um, Surrey County Councillor for Farnham North. George Wilson, Waverley Councillor for Farncombe and Cattishall. Uh, Jack Roberts, uh, Parking Engineer for S Surrey Highways. And I'm Dan Williams, Surrey County Council Countryside Access Officer. Um, Joanne Porter, Surrey County Council Countryside Access Assistant. Right. Yvette Ortel, the committee officer. Thank you all very much. Uh, so now we move to apologies. We have received apologies from Trevor Sadler, Steve Cosser and Peter Clark. Um, now we move to item two, the minutes for approval. Um, Mr Hyman, I believe you wish to say something. Thank you very much for your forbearance, uh, Chairman. Yes, on page five, near the top, under question two, supplementary question, um, a, a, another member did uh, question whether I was telling the truth in what I was saying when, uh, in the middle of that statement, it's, uh, I, it's minuted as, um, sorry, County Council officers and Waverley Borough Council officers say that the modelling has been done, but I don't believe this. Just wanted to, um, you had kindly allowed me to speak for three minutes, and, and you can't fit three minutes onto it. Uh, a few lines, so I'm not questioning the, the, the minutes themselves, but I would like to just, I have distributed a piece of paper, which is a legal notice from Waverley Borough Council to Cress Nicholson from November 2010, which each of the members here has, and you have a copy in front of you. And on the second side, uh, you'll see that, um, uh, and this text was actually written by the air quality officer, was ba but was, ba was backed, supported by the borough solicitor and uh, the, the person who signed this document, which was Elizabeth Sims. And it says, um, and I quote, uh, that there's a lack of clarity in respect of the effect of the phasing of the Royal Deer traffic lights. There is no modelling of how this junction would operate and the in combination effects uh, um, uh, has not been assessed. And then the requirement that um, in law 
Cress Nicholson were required to provide that information in, in the event Cress Nicholson were un unable to provide that information and the councils proceeded and granted consent without it. But uh, uh, just to clarify that it's not me saying that I don't believe this, that uh, actually this was um, a, there's a, there's a legal notice um, stating that's okay. the case. So. Thank you, Mr Hyman, for your explanation. I understand what you're saying, but the thing is that the letter from Elizabeth Sims is dated the 29th of November 2010, and I accept that what that letter says that on the 29th of November 2010 there was the, the modelling, uh, uh, you know, modelling. There is no modelling on that date. Yes. I have absolutely no information as to whether or not information modelling was done since that date. So, um, but we, we did have you can you can confirm that we did have a meeting where we'd asked to see the Farnham model and uh, and they were unable look, to provide that. So I do just to I do that. agree that Mr. Hyman, but I, we have spent an enormous amount of time on the question of the modelling or lack of modelling of this particular thing, and I really do not wish this committee to become a committee of you know discussion of this particular thing which happened some years ago. And I really think we should just move on. We have plenty. We have a packed agenda this morning. Um, if anybody wishes to um, second you on your um, request to amend the minutes, I'll be happy to make an amendment. Does anybody? I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't ask for that. Okay. I was just clarification because, and this is the largest issue for the lar largest town in the borough, and it is going to be installed without assessing the consequences this later this year. Uh, so it is. Uh, it is a, a major issue for us, but perhaps more for transport development planning TDP rather than uh, for this this committee. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Right. Um, please, could members agree that the minutes are accurate? Are there any other comments on them? Agreed. Thank you. Uh, now we move to item three, declarations of interest. Please, could members declare any disclosable pecuniary interest in respect of any item to be dis um, discussed at this meeting? None? Oh, Mr. Spin, thanks. Um, not a pecuniary interest, but in terms of uh, conflict of interest, I'm a member of the Ramblers Association, which I want to declare in regard to the footpath issues on the agenda. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? We normally then have a... No, you're the only rambler of this group, fine. Um, chairman's announcement. Um, I just wanted to let you know that going forward, the Waverley Local Committee will meet three times per year. Um, it's planned to have meetings in June, uh, November and March, and we will shortly be circulating dates. Um, so now, item five, petitions. We have received a petition from Malcolm Carter. Mr. Carter, are you present? Yes. You may speak for up to three minutes on your petition. Thank you very much. Um, you have a number of uh, photos on your uh, pad from, uh, which we sent through as well to help you. Uh, the A287 through Beacon Hill is the only built-up area that has a 40 mile an hour limit between Farnham and, Hampshire, and, and Hazelmere. Over the past five years, there have been a number of serious collisions which thankfully have not resulted in deaths, the latest being in December last year through the village on your picture on your photo one, shows you this, where it happened, where a van collided with a car resulting in the total road closure of the A2874 for four hours whilst the driver was cut out of the vehicle. In the eyes of the residents, this is an anomaly, as the roadways through from the south and north enable the vehicles to exceed 40 miles per hour frequently. Uh, and over the last five years, there has been an increase in pedestrians accessing the village and school, as well as it being a keen cyclist route. Photos 2, 3, 4, 4A show where the village main crossing points are, it takes place opposite Lloyd's Chemist, the bus stop going north, and for pedestrians accessing the village, particularly for the school, there are many families that walk down to the school on the west side, the far side of the road, as this is the only continuous pavement from Hindhead Village. Photos 5, 6 and 7 show you once in the central mile, there is a bus route out of Wood Road and bus stops either side in the central village, which are frequented by the elderly, disabled and disadvantaged. 
Centrally, Whitmore Vale House, which is a home for those required assisted living. These residents use the village and bus facilities freely, but sadly are not always traffic smart. The remainder of Beacon Hill Village, the East and Tilford Road, is all controlled at 30 miles an hour. So it would be as simple to transfer this to the 287 as it has all the correct street lighting. Photos 8, 9 and 10 show where speeding traffic has had frequent accidents <coughs> from the North Farnham side and the traffic leaves Chert at 30 miles an hour and accelerates up past the busy entrance of Hindhead Golf Club which has about 200 movements of traffic every day. It's not unusual to see traffic being overtaken prior to these entrances and there have been at least three accidents in the last two years along that strait. From the south, a great deal of traffic accelerates down the Tilford intersection at greater speeds of 40 mile an hour, which is, must have been a concern as the road has already got marked slow on it. Warning uh, is marked on the road before turning to Hillgarth. And there are pictures showing, the last picture showing you what it is to turn out of Hillgarth. So to summarise these three points, 40 miles an hour areas are seldom checked by the police for speeding vehicles. This has become a popular cyclist route and there is now a greater concern for the environment and a slower speed can only support this. This whole stretch of road is bordered by areas of outstanding natural beauty, so please help us to do our part as a community. Thank you very much. Um, Mr Apicello, I believe you have the response to this. Yes, thank you. Um, analysis of the collision data for the uh, 8287 Church Road and Beacon Hill show that there's no recorded injury accidents within the last three years. However, the uh, incident that you mentioned uh, might not have come through to our system, um, which does not indicate that there's a particular safety problem uh, along the section of road in terms of a history of poor road safety. Uh, the cost to assess and lower the speed limit on the 8287 Church Road would be in the region of 10 to 15 thousand pounds, depending. Um, uh, providing that it meets the criteria set out in the County Council policy for setting local speed limits, which can be found on the County Council website. Um, officers requested a basic speed survey is undertaken near the junction of Wood Road, um, and the data, I believe, has just been passed over, which I'll be able to share with you um, after the meeting. Um, it would be at the discretion of the Western Villages um, Divisional Member, Councillor David Harmer, and this committee to prioritise and fund this scheme as part of the uh, Highway Works programme this year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr Harmer, do you want to say anything? Well, uh, I, 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 I wasn't thinking in terms of this financial year coming because uh, the money's already been allocated by agreement amongst the Western Villages. Uh, so, but, it, and at the moment, uh, I don't know whether it would pass a test. So I'm anxious that before we come to any conclusions, we have those speed tests done uh, above and below because they have to be done anyway before anything proceeds. Uh, if they pass that test, I mean, I, I generally take this position. First of all, the strategic view. Secondly, the specific view. And then we'll look for the money. We need to do it in that order, otherwise we end up getting nothing done. And we have considerable experience of that happening in the Western Villages because we did things in the wrong order or tried to do things in the wrong order and they didn't happen. So the first step is to have those tests done. The second step, if it passes those tests, which essentially means that the average would have to be below 34 miles an hour now in both directions, uh, then I think the next thing would be to uh, consult the police as, on the assumption that we would be proceeding as soon as we have the money to allocate towards it. Uh, and we can work out how to do that when we know that that's what we want to do with it. So we need to go in that sequence. And uh, so I don't know how quickly, perhaps Mr Selby could indicate when, how quickly we might be able to get the answers to those tests. You said that you think it's already been done <coughs> uh, in both directions, below and above. Uh, we've um, had the data back, however, unfortunately, I'm, a I'm able to download it on my device. Um, the speed readings um, are around about 38 miles an hour, which would not meet the criteria for um, a reduction to 30. 
Okay, so we, we need to make sure that we understand that fully, and if it doesn't meet the requirements at the moment, then the normal arrangement is that if, uh, if the community wishes to proceed with it, then we first of all have to work out what engineering measures could be introduced in order to get the speed down to where it needs to be. Otherwise, we know the police will say no, if it's not meeting the criteria. And probably Mr Kemp and his friends <laughs> in the in Surrey Cabinet would say no as well, for similar so, reasons. Mr Harmer, could I interrupt you slightly and say that perhaps you could take offline the specific discussion about this. I'd be happy to put this on our decision tracker just so that we keep an eye on matters. Um, and um, so the recommendation is just to note the officer response. Is that agreed? Agreed. Thank you. And you and Mr Harmer and Mr Selby could perhaps Mr. meet. Mr Harmer is welcome to have discussions with us. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you. Right. Now we move to item six, the written public questions, which are on the green sheets for those of you with paper copies. We've had five public questions. Um, so the first three... Um, from Councillor Maxine Gale, Julian Wilson and Zoe Collier. Um, is somebody here on behalf of Zoe? No. Um, so as they are on essentially the same subject, um, there's a response. Would you, so first of all, Councillor Gale, would you like to ask a supplementary question? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, reading the, the response, the written response, I'm sorry to say that the actual questions from myself have not really been answered regarding a CCTV investigation. However, the silted up bridge would appear to be at the heart of the problems in the area, so my supplementary question has to be, are Surrey County Council the riparian owners of the said bridge? In which case, according to the riparian owner's fact sheet, which was produced, um, you should keep it clear to allow the free flow of water throughout the land without obstruction or causing pollution or affecting how the water will flow onto other people's property. And if they are not the owner, who is and have they been in contact with them? Thank you. Um, Frank? Um, yes, thank you. Um, I assume <coughs> we are. Um, because it's, it's, it's a highway over the river, um, so we will possibly be the owners of the bridge. Um, as I've said in, in the response, the problem we have at this particular location is the, um, the lowness, want a better word, of the area. We have had unprecedented um, rainfall the last few months, weeks, days, and the, the, the highway relies wholly, every gully that we have on the side of the road drains the public highway. We then, in turn, rely upon ditches, pipes off of the road, then ultimately lead to the rivers. The rivers will then take that water away. In this particular instance, the gullies are so close to the river that when the river has risen to levels where that water cannot, because it has gone above the pipe, the outlet pipe, the water cannot then discharge into the rivers. And so all that happens is all that build-up ends up on the road. Now, yes, you are correct. Some of the arches underneath that bridge have silted up. Um, we have been in conversations with the EA with regards to carrying out some works to, their, um, to the, river them, the river itself. <clears throat> at the moment they haven't got anything programmed to do that however what we have programmed once the weather has settled and we've got drier weather because at the moment the, the ground conditions are so wet in the area <coughs> that we have no way of accessing the river because it, it is just saturated we need to get machinery in there to be able to remove some of that silt from under the bridge once we've been able to do that then that should hopefully improve the situation but as I said once that river has risen to the, to the level that it's above the outlet of the pipe, whatever you do, the road, unfortunately, will flood. Yes. Sorry, if, if I just may come back on that. Um, when we've gone over this subject many, many times before, 
we've always been told there isn't enough money to actually unsilt the, the culverts under the road. So are we being told now, yes, there is funding available, this will be done when the weather improves and you can get to it? Yes, we will be um, r removing the silt from under the culvert under the bridge as soon as the weather improves. Um, Mr. Wilson, are you here? I don't think so. Zoe Collier. Uh, Zoe Collier, are you here? No. And then Gillian McCaldin is speaking. All right. On behalf. So then we move to. Yes. May I ask for your uh, discretion in letting me uh, comment briefly on this matter? I will not take up members' uh, time for uh, very long at uh, all. Uh, I did speak about this in September. Um, sorry, M Miss uh, uh, Christine, could we just finish the questions and then you may just say something briefly about the... Um Gillian McAlden is here. Miss Gillian McAlden, and you're here, aren't you? Thank you. So you're speaking on behalf of Mrs. Smith? No. Yes, Cathy Smith can't be here, but she, yeah. she did uh, submit a written question. Yes, so um, you would like to ask a supplementary on her yes. behalf? Yes, yeah. C could I just say on that, the, that written question, there does seem to be um, indications that the situation has improved since Crown Golf have been doing some work um, along the wall. So thank you very much for encouraging them to, <laughs> to do that work. Um, my supplementary question... Um, when can we expect the cyclic cleansing team to be along Station Lane? Because the flooding has um, not only left a lot of silt on the pavement and the, in the, and the gutters, but the drains are completely blocked. I take Frank's point that when, they re when the water reaches the level of the gullies, it can't get away, but those gullies are actually blocked, so the water can't flow away. Yes, we, we have a program of um, removing silt from gullies. In this particular location, we have recently carried out some works, obviously due to the height of the water that was, that was happening. Um, once it all settles back down again, we will be revisiting those and removing the silt. Um, we had a similar problem very recently on the Portsmouth Road where Thames water had a, a leak, and again, a lot of material was being washed into the gullies and silting them up. So... Yes, we, we have a programme and this will be added to that list to that, be done, hopefully, again, in the next, within the next three to four weeks. W OK, we were told it would be by the 15th of March, which is Sunday. They may be going to do it today or over the weekend, but uh, there seems to be a discrepancy there. We have had some unprecedented weather recently and those crews have been here, there and everywhere. So I, I that, that date is possibly not that. as accurate as we would probably have liked it. But while the situation continues, any pedestrians trying to walk to the station are getting drenched from head to foot. We will, get, we will get out there as, as we, soon as we do appreciate as we the can. problem, but I mean, unfortunately, it is the same across the county. I suspect, in, or there have been, unpre you know, I don't need to tell you, there has been unprecedented rainfall. Um, now, Mrs. Baker. Um, Mr. Law, we'll have Mrs. Baker, you may have one minute just to talk briefly on this matter and then we'll go to Jumps Road. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Um, well, I am supporting the, the, uh, the theme of the questions that you've just heard and we've heard answered. But can I say that I spoke to this major problem for Milford residents and indeed for vehicles passing through in September and was rather dismissed in my comments if that clearance under the, in the culverts under the bridge had actually been carried out then as a result of my warnings we wouldn't be worrying about the state of the ground there at the moment I am just rather alarmed that when things are flagged up Nobody seems to take any notice at county. And I do think that you have to bear in mind that this is a strategic route 
and there are people in Milford who actually go round in disabled buggies. They couldn't possibly get through those floods in safety. And you've heard all the other users and the problems they have. Thank That's you. It. Thank you very much. Right, uh, now the question five, Mr. Philip Law on behalf of Jumps Road Chert. Um, you have your answer to your question. Um, would you like to ask a supplementary question? Yes, I would, please. Thank you. Um, with respect to Surrey Highway's um, response to the question, we don't feel it's been uh, answered. Um, it is clearly evident that the recommendation that's been put forward um, to this committee um, will not address the congestion and the safety issues um, that have and I'm sure Surrey Highways will acknowledge being subject to persistent complaints. Um, and in fact, we feel that the recommendation could indeed make matters worse. Um, so I guess our, our, our question is, we would, we kindly request that the councillors consider whether the best course of action would be not to approve this uh, current recommendation, but in instead defer uh, the issue so that it can be fully and properly considered before a decision is taken on the matter. Um, and the reason we put this forward is that we've got, you know, the unanimous view of both Frensham and Chert parish councils is that a, a rural clearway would be uh, the preferred uh, course of action. Uh, B, the resounding objection of, uh, of uh, more than 50 residents on Jumps Road to the limited double yellow line propo uh, proposal, which has also been circulated to the councillors ahead of this meeting. Um, and also see the findings of a, an expert uh, technical report instructed by residents of Jumps Road that supports the residents' concern, um, which has also been circulated, also shows that this proposal will have no effect whatsoever on the worsening and dangerous parking um, at that end of Jumps Road. Um, thank you very much. Mr Harmer, as a local member, would you like to say something? Well, just to say that I've uh, discussed this matter with both the parish councils and both the parish council chairman are here, uh, and um, it, it's up to them what they want to do, in my view. Right, so this brings um, item six to an end. So, so item seven, written members' questions. We've not received any uh, member questions today. So we can now move to item eight, the alleged public footpath off Woodside Road, Chiddingfold, in my division. Just to remind the committee, a rights of way application has different rules for public engagement. Um, to be able to speak on this application, you need to have previously made written representation to the countryside team, and this should be reflected within the report. Um, may I remind you that no new evidence can be presented at this stage. There can be no public questions or petitions on the rights of way matter under discussion. Members may, however, question the officer. Uh, today we have one person registered to speak. No other member of the public is able to speak regarding the proposed order. So do I have Haroon Khan here? Thank you. Um, I would like to welcome the officer, Daniel Williams, who will present the report. Oh. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Khan, in fact, you... Um... Do I go first? Yes. Okay, sorry, thank you. Um, I'm conscious that I've only got three minutes, so I'll, I'll, I'll dive straight in. As we have previously stated in correspondence with officers, and having obtained specialist counsel's advice, we maintain that the application is invalid and the council therefore ought not to determine it. We say this because given that part of the alleged footpath falls within uh, an unregistered parcel of land, the applicant was legally obliged to place publicity notices on that land prior to submitting the application and then to certify to the council that this had been done we have recently discovered that whilst the applicant did serve a notification certificate with the application back in June 2017, that certificate stated only that a notice 
had been served on an identifiable landowner of another section of the footpath. The certificate made no mention of notices having been physically placed on the land as per the legal requirement to which I've just referred. After, after we queried this discrepancy in a letter to the council last month, the applicant suddenly issued a revised certificate wherein it was now claimed that notices had in fact been displayed on the land at the time of the application. The suggestion being that the applicant had simply forgotten to include that detail in the original certificate. We are deeply concerned that the council's officers have seemingly taken the revised certificate at face value, despite the lack of any contemporaneous evidence, such as photographs, for example. Moreover, it appears that despite being part of the investigating authority, the officers did not seek to ask even the most rudimentary of questions before accepting that certificate. For example, roughly when the notices were placed, for how long, and to what objects on the land they were affixed. Accordingly, we strongly disagree with the assertion at paragraph 316 of the officer's report that the procedural deficiencies have now been addressed. There is one further point that I should like to uh, quickly address in the time that I've got remaining, and this goes to a, to a point of fact rather than procedure. And this is the applicant's assertion that the width of the alleged path at points A to B is three metres. It is readily apparent to anyone who visits the site that the land at points A to B is regularly driven down by car drivers going to and from the various garages, the in-use garages located on the adjoining land. Your time is almost out. Just uh, sorry, sorry, I'll, I'll just finish yeah. this point. Yeah. It's simply not the case that the entire three metre area has been <clears throat> excuse me, regularly walked upon, a fact which is affirmed by the accentuated grass mound which runs through the centre of that three metre section. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. Um, so now, Mr Williams, would you like to present the officer report, please? Thank you, Chairman. <coughs> Excuse me. The County Council has a duty under Section 53 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981 to modify the definitive map and statement if it discovers evidence which can be reasonably alleged to support such a modification. Key here is that an application was received for a map modification order under, under Section 53.5 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act to add a public footpath on land between Woodside Road and public footpath 211 Chiddingfold to the Surrey County Council definitive map and statement as shown on the plan attached with the report. This application requires the council to determine the matter within a certain period of time and gives the application certain rights of appeal should we fail to determine the matter. The county council's duty, however, to examine the evidence which has been put before it is drawn from section 53.2 of the 1981 Wildlife and Countryside Act and is in no way dependent upon receipt of an application under 53.5 of that Act, which Mr Haroon Khan has referred to. Uh, the gist of that is that even if the application can be shown to have not been correctly made, and we do not believe that is the case, we still have a duty to decide the evidence. Section 31 of the Highways Act, 1980, provides that a claimant's evidence must show that the route has been enjoyed by the public for a 20-year period, calculated retrospectively from the point at which that use was first challenged. Use must be without force, secrecy or permission. Public use can also lead to the acquisition of public rights at common law. For such a right to become established, it is necessary that there has been dedication by the landowner and an acceptance by the public. Dedication may be inferred if landowners show acquiescence by knowing about and ignoring use, or that use is so great that landowners, whoever they are, must have known and taken no action. And under common law, there is no minimum time period over which use must have occurred. 
Alternatively, we may also look at documentary and historical sources as important evidence. In this case, use by walkers varies from every day to every few months. Total use in the year adds up to over 2,500 times, with an average of 117 times a year. 13 users walk the path 50 or more times a year, and the reasons for it were the usual dog walking, fresh air, exercise, uh, recreational walking, going to the pub, etc. Evidence suggests that landowners have not challenged users or taken any actions to demonstrate their lack of intention to dedicate during the relevant period, and this is quite key. With regard to the issue over the application, which I said is not important for determining the matter, I should say that the original application was made in June 2017, and notice was served on the primary landowner. Uh, it does appear that it was overlooked um, that another landowner had not been served notice, and this was also later done, and that a section of the land was unregistered. The uh, applicant in this case has subsequently and recently certified that they did put notices on the ground uh, to fulfil the criteria uh, of the, um, the legislation. Um, I should point out that uh, while it, it has been suggested that this does not qualify, uh, there's nothing in the legislation or its accompanying guidance suggests there's a time limit by which an application must be completed in terms of certification. With uh, one final point that was also just raised with regards to the three metre width and reference to a grassy mound down the centre of the claim between A and B, I think it is, uh, this grassy mound is, having looked at photographs today, a few inches high with a few inches of grass on it. Uh, it seems extremely unlikely that people won't have passed over that walking along this route. So, and I think that's, that's just a completely irrelevant point here. Um, in the light of the above, uh, it's the officer's view that footpath rights have been acquired over the route under Section 31 of the Highways Act and also at common law. Uh, and I ask the uh, members to agree with the recommendations in the report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, members' questions. Mr Gray. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to commend the, the, the officer for his report and also for his explanation to us um, lesser mortals about the objections that were made and the relevance of it. Um, the residents of Chiddingfold will be delighted with this. This is something which has gone on for a long time. Um, they have put a lot of work into it, um, and I would certainly commend to my colleagues that this is approved. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Mrs Barton. I'm sorry, I just didn't catch who the, um, the, the earlier speaker was representing. Could you just clarify? Thank you. Mr. Cullen, yes, I act for Reside Developments Limited, who have an interest. Uh, I forget what, sorry, I forget what page of plans. Oh, page 25. If you look at the plan on page 25, it's the land which immediately adjoins the western edge of points A to C. Sorry, points B to C. So it's marked as Apple Tree Cottage, although I don't think that's the that's the official name. Oh, so just to clarify, you you're, you represent the land owner of the la obviously not those houses, but the I field behind. I, I represent somebody who's got an option to acquire that land from the landowner. Right. Yeah. Not the land. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Baker. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have lived very close to this area since 1974. Um, I know many Chiddingfold villagers, and I've heard them talk about this footpath over years since 1974. I also know quite a number of the people who've actually given evidence as to their use of the footpath. I should add, I don't know the footpath myself, and I know that what I'm saying is hearsay, but I have very good reason in any case uh, to support the legal arguments in favour of this becoming a footpath. So I should be voting in favour. Thank you. 
Uh, Mr Martin. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Yes, I too have uh, examined this in some detail. Um, interesting, I looked up on my Surrey A to Z dating 2002 and the path is clearly marked uh, on that. So it does seem to be a fairly well established um, route uh, and on the evidence that I have seen, um, I would have no doubt uh, in supporting the, uh, the applicant and going with the recommendation. Thank you. Mr Hyman. Thank you. I, I, I was somewhat sceptical, but uh, when, I, when I looked at paragraphs 318 and 319, the documentary evidence <coughs> in respect of this, especially at 3.19, 3 319, um, it says the section of path between A to C is shown on the Chiddingfold Tithe map of 1842 and described in the, uh, a, a, as a lane. Um, and the Ordnance Survey map of 77-78, 1977-78, is shown as a double-pecked line from point C in a northerly direction, and also aerial photographs have shown it over many, many years. So I think I'm quite convinced that this has got a, lot, a, a long history of use. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the path is in my division. Um, I also have had a look at it and was also swayed by the evidence of the old maps showing it, etc. Um, so I'm going to ask, so the Waverley Local Committee is asked to agree that public footpath rights are recognised over the route shown on drawing number 3 stroke 1 stroke 4 stroke H27 as alleged uh, public footpath number 557 Chiddingfold between points A to B to C to D to E and that a map modification order under sections 53 and 57 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981 be made to modify the def definitive map um, and statement for Surrey. In the event that the County Council of the County Council being directed to make a map, map modification order by the Secretary of State following an appeal by the claimant the County Council as surveying authority will adopt a neutral stance at any public inquiry or hearing, making all the evidence available to help the inspector determine the case. May I have a show of hands, please? First of all, those for the recommendation. Thank you. Um, a show of hands for those against the recommendation. And a show of hands for those abstaining from voting. Thank you very much. So we continue on the theme of um, rights of way. Um, item <coughs> nine. Um, this is a footpath in Elstead. Um, I'm grateful to Mr Hyman and Mrs Baker who came with me on a site visit last week. I'm pleased to say nobody actually fell in, although it did become fairly close at times. Mr Hyman's waders would have been um, useful on this occasion. Um, so the same rules apply as for the previous right-of-way item. Um, three people have registered to speak, two against the proposal and one in support. Uh, no other member of the public is able to speak regarding the proposed order. So first of all, do we have Mr David O'Connell? So you may speak for up to three minutes against the proposal. Thank you. I would like to speak about this proposal. Um, an important um, question I would ask all the councillors to consider before deciding at the end of my two or three minutes and those of my colleagues is that has the council properly surveyed the proposed diversion at what is shown to be Footbridge B? Because the council, Surrey County Council has history on this matter when their previous diversion plan, which coincidentally completely um, followed the permitted path put in by the landlord and removed all right to public enjoyment of the river, has, it has been discovered, um, more liable to flood than the existing path at 64. An important question also for members, I feel, is that where the path is shown to divert from B to C, was that this, uh, I would want ask, ask you to consider, why was this uh, suggested? Is it not putting the needs of the, and interests of the landowner 
above that of the public who use this park for hundreds of years. The council, in the evidence which has been presented, of course I've not seen which you, what you have seen, make reference to the concern they have in maintaining bridges. We're not talking about flyovers over the M1. If anyone did do a visit, you would see those couple of railway sleepers in, in three positions. And despite the fact that Surrey County Council has effectively closed this park since 2014, they remain passable, as members who went down there recently may have seen. I have had concerns expressed with Ms Porter about the actions of the Surrey County Council it being unduly influenced by the interests of the landlord. I realise the interests of the landlord are important and it would, be, it would be helpful if they could be brought on board. However, in this particular case, the actions in relation to Part 65, although I do not object to it, show in my, an inconsistent approach between the Surrey County Council's access team has adopted, in particular allowing Part 65 65 to be diverted without any application, say, from the council, allowing uh, Path 65 to be illegally obstructed across a stile. There is history in relation to the council's actions. In Path 64, in 2017, the landlord again erected illegally barriers uh, on the footpath, which was not closed. Finally, I'd like to read into the record correspondence I had with Ms Porter in October of uh, 2019, and I asked her, does she accept, did, does Surrey County Council accept that the powers under the Highways Act to divert onto the deviated path established over many years could have been affected effectively in 2014? The reply I had was yes. This path has been taken out of public commission for six years, largely as a result of the actions and inaction of Surrey County Council. And I would ask very carefully before you voted to take away this historic path, that all options and that the process has been followed correctly. Thank you very much. Now, um, secondly, we have uh, uh, Julie Edwards is registered to speak for three minutes against the proposal. However, she is ill and um, exceptionally because of the current corona situation, I will read out a, her statement um, so you can hear what she has to say. So, in connection with the issue raised in our lawyer's letter, which has just been read out, to which we have had no reply from the council, I would like the committee to be aware that we have also pointed out that the plan has been used to illustrate the intended diversion is misleading, as it does not accurately show the current position of the river and the extent to which the line of the definitive route now runs into the middle of the river. We object to the changes to the footpath as proposed by the council because the river is continuing rapidly to erode the area where the proposed path would run. The erosion of this path has been an ever-present issue for the council for over 20 years and simply moving it over a bit is not a long-term solution. However, due to the erosion affecting the footpath, we created a permissive path which we have permitted to be used for several years now, which is not at threat of erosion. It is currently used by large numbers of walkers every week. <coughs> we suggest that our permissive path be used as the new definitive route so that the public right-of-way can be maintained without this issue having to be revisited for many decades. Sorry, I was just interrupt there, but you, you read that out as being an objector to the path. As a supporter, by the sounds of it. She, no, she's, she's objecting. Um, right, next, Pat Murph. Chair, just a point of order. Could I, could, who is Julie Edwards? Is she a landowner or a resident? Or, or, and which bit of the path is she referring to? I presume it, it's, the, it's around the point of A on the map. I'm unclear as to which part of the footpath she's referring to. I presume it's the one straight along the river, but I would like clarification. Um, uh, Daniel, are you able to answer? Uh, she is, I understand, the owner of the entirety of the path over which the diversion runs. And, and so she's objecting to the entire, or she's commenting on the entire route um, alongside the river. Is that, is that what you, is that correct understanding of what she's trying to say? Um, 
that's quite difficult to say. I mean, I think she's suggesting a slightly different route. Um, yes, I mean, what, what she's suggesting is a route that she has laid out uh, on the ground as a permissive route that we have consulted on previously and received a very large number of objections uh, from locals and user groups. So we therefore moved on uh, to look at the route that's been put before committee here. Thank you. So, um, Pat Murphy, are you... Yes, thank yes. you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And Mr. Um, Mr. Um, Mr. Murphy is going to speak for three minutes in support of the proposal. Thank you. Um, I'm the Chairman of Elstead Parish Council. Um, Footpath 64 is a very attractive and <coughs> popular right-of-way, and it's one of the few routes open to the public which allows direct access to the banks of the uh, Upper River Way. And prior to the closure of the route in 2014, it's be, it was widely used not only by Elstead parishioners, but also by many walkers from much further afield. And even since it's been formally closed, the public has accessed the route informally, often uh, trespassing on neighboring land and breaking down barriers and fences. Um, over the 40 or so years that I've lived in Elstead, uh, there have been two main problems with this route. Uh, firstly, parts of the southern section have been falling into the river, and at the northern end, a lengthy section is subject to flooding, and for much of the year is pretty well impassable, as I think you've probably found. Um, yes. The proposals now put forward by Surrey County Council would deal with both problems. Uh, the minor diversion of the southern section to the west would, in my view, and in the Parish Council's view, uh, provide a safe and accessible route for the foreseeable future. I mean, the, the river will continue to erode the banks, but I think this diversion will secure the route for, for many years. Um, and the diversion of the northern section would bypass a flood, the flooded area and would ensure the route will be accessible even in wet weather. Uh, I understand the objections of the Ramblers Association, Mr O'Connell, to this latter diversion. Um, as often is the case, the, the best is the enemy of the good. Um, uh, the Parish Council believes this latter diversion to the north is in the public interest. A spring runs down the route of this section of Footpath 64, and the only way of remediating this problem would be by the creation of a lengthy boardwalk now, this would be expensive, both to construct and to maintain, and I don't think it's practicable in the current circumstances. Um, I note the, um, the landowner's uh, uh, proposal for the uh, alternative permissible uh, route. That would take the general public away from this very attractive riverside walk, and I don't think would be at all in the public interest, and there have been many objections to this. So I don't think that is a, 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 an acceptable alternative solution. So Elstead Parish Council fully supports Surrey County Council's proposals for the diversion of both Footpath 64 and the minor diversion of Footpath 65. In the Parish Council's view, this would be in the public interest, and indeed in the interest of the landowner concerned, and it would prevent a lot of the uh, current trespass and breaking down of barriers and fences. So I, we fully support this proposal. It's been too long delayed, and we, we think we ought to get ahead, go ahead with it as soon as possible. Thank you, Madam, Madam Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, members, do you have questions for the officers? Daniel, you're going to speak to us. Oh, I'm, so, I'm so sorry, yes? Yeah, you too. Not on this one. No, 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 he hasn't on this one. No. Don't. I'm happy to speak. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> um, this report seeks a decision, uh, as you've heard, on whether to make a legal order to divert uh, parts of footpath 64 and 65 in Elstead. Sections of the current definitive route, public footpath 64, have fallen into the riverway, and diverting a section of the path five metres to the west will mean that it will continue to run parallel to the river. Diverting another section away from the river, river then will prevent further loss of the path into the river. Section 119 of the Highways Act enables the County Council to divert a public <coughs> footpath if it appears to the Council that it is in the interest of the landowner, lessee or occupier of the land crossed by the path, or in this case, in the interest of the public. 
Uh, it also must be expedient in the line, uh, if it's in, in the interest of the public and is expedient, that the line of the path should be diverted. Pardon me. In doing so, regard must be had to the enjoyment of the public and the effect the diversion would have on the land. Any uh, alternative route must not be substantially less convenient to the public than the current definitive route. Uh, Kent's Council's own policy also states um, that except in exceptional circumstances, diversion orders will only be made where they result in an improvement to the rights away network as a whole for the public. And needs of less able users must be taken into account. Uh, in this case, you've heard a little bit about the background. Uh, this is a very wet area. And uh, when we went out to visit, there was a lot of standing water. And I think, you know, we, we've got to expect that in some winters, particularly extreme winters like today. Um, the efforts of this diversion uh, are in the interest of the public to move it away from risk of erosion by the river, uh, whilst taking into account that there are going to be periods when it is always going to be very wet here, uh, such, as, such as it has been. Um, as some of you probably know, the road itself by Elstead Mill was underwater quite recently, so we must expect the fields to also occasionally be. Um, I should perhaps mention, in fairness, uh, with regard to the landowner, she referred in the statement that was read out by the chairman uh, to a solicitor's letter, and her solicitor drew attention to a piece of uh, case law that suggests where rights of way have been lost to rivers or off cliffs that they may be legally uh, extinguished and her solicitor has drawn this, uh, drew this to our attention. Um, we have taken this into account and also looked at more contemporary case law that suggests a more pragmatic viewpoint uh, can be taken. So we believe in the circumstances, a diversion order uh, is the most practical and sensible way to progress this. Uh, and uh, I would recommend the report and our recommendations to committee. Thank you. Uh, members, uh, Mrs. Uh, Mr. Hyman, first of all. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, well, when we went on, on the site visit last Friday, it was wet, and we weren't um, excessively brave or stupid in um, in our travels. And I, th I think if <laughs> all right, I, I suppose we were. We. Uh, from, from the bottom, we walked up foot, Footpath 64, and, and uh, we, the, the path was then blocked off a little bit further up. We went round that, but it did become unpassable. We did not get anywhere near to um, the footbridge at B. Um, and uh, going back, we then, I think, diverted along the path which is shown going uh, westwards from point A. Am I correct in that? Uh, and we went along there about three quarters of an inch possibly uh, you could say uh, b before before that became impassable and and I did try going across the field and it went when it got about six inches deep you, you well you can't see whether it's going to get any deeper and fall into a big hole so I didn't uh, do a great deal more than that so I, I think in retrospect perhaps we should have tried to access every path from every possible entrance we didn't go around the top and, and you know with the benefit of hindsight we could have gone up Fulbrook Lane and and seen it from the other end, but I think the other end would have been equally wet and flooded. Yeah. In fact, more so um, from my experience. So, you know, I mean, it is a long time. I, I used to go up here when I was a kid, but that was the 1970s. So I don't know really what it's like up the top there now. Um, I am concerned, I, th I think the bit that, w that is contentious by the sounds of it, it, it uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is, is sort of from where it says footbridge at B across to D, where that is the replacement route instead of B to C. And one argument would say, well, from B to C, you soon leave the river bank anyway, so it's not a river side walk as such. So what we're doing is giving people a far longer walk around. Is that correct? And, uh, but what I'd like to know is, is there, is there a particular advantage that I don't know about, or that we don't know about, to the landowner of, of um, not allowing people to walk along from B to C 
um, that, that, that I, you know, that I ought to, that we should know about. Uh, would that path still be an informal? I mean, <laughs> obviously, it would no longer be the definitive route. So I assume the answer to this part of my question would be um, no. You could, we, there would be no rights to go along it. But would people still be able to pass in what is a far more direct route in the in the summertime? Um, you know, I'm, I'm almost tempted to say, actually, I'd like to leave this till the summer, go look at it when, when it's dry, and so, so that I can really understand what it's about. But I don't want to labour it too much if everybody's um, sort of happy. I, but it doesn't sound to me like everybody is happy, and I would like to get this right if it's been banging on for all these years. So could I have a, um, a little bit of an explanation on that? I was happy with what I saw on Friday, but I hadn't heard what, the, what had been said this, this, this morning, so thanks. Thank you. Um, I'll try and address the point about B to C. Uh, it is my understanding that uh, B to C uh, is, has been extremely wet, and actually that B to D, which I think was also originally suggested by, by the landowner, uh, is slightly less wet. I mean, our experience of walking it before it went under water was that that was the case. Also, just north of B, there are two sort of crossings of uh, small waterways uh, where the speed of the erosion of the river has been faster, so there's a bit of a concern there, continually moving bridges. Um, so we think basically turning the diversion west towards D before we get to that apex of the bend where erosion is at its quickest will avoid having to continually deal with that backwards erosion. Um, Mrs Barton. Oh, sorry, Mr. Sorry, Mrs Baker. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Well, I didn't know when I joined this committee that I was going to be going paddling. It almost became swimming. Um, and next time, perhaps it could be at the seaside for variety. But anyway, um, it was worth going on that site visit. Um, and uh, we did establish the course of the river when we swung round the end of the footpath closure barrier. Um, and I nearly filled uh, the boots that I was wearing with river water. However, um, to address myself to, to the points that have been made by various parties, uh, including footpaths officers, um, I think there were limitations on what we could actually look at for ourselves at the site visit. Um, but we certainly did our best and the person that I have paid particular attention to is the chairman of the parish council. When we've been discussing whether we should, whether when it's been mentioned that maybe we should leave this till it's drier, I think nobody knows better than the chairman of the parish council exactly what the conditions are like the year round. And he is supporting the proposal. So... I am going to support the proposal because he does. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mrs Barton? Um, I just like, could you just clarify again the question that uh, Councillor Hyman asked about the adv any advantage to the landowner, the, the, the landlord, um, I suppose, in the property maybe by C, of, um, on the B to C section of this diversion? I just want to make sure that it hasn't got a, there's not a hidden agenda anywhere. Thank you. Oh, yes, it's undeniable that the landlord's uh, property is just to the east of C. Um, this diversion, uh, as it says in the report, is made in the interests of the public, though, and we do have to be quite clear whose interest we're making it in when we make an order. Um, I think perhaps, though, the fact that the landowner is objecting to this proposal uh, confirms to us that... <laughs> It's, it can't be that much in, in her interest if she is objecting to it. Does that help? Uh, Mr. Harmer, it's your division. It is my division. First of all, I'd like to thank the three members who went on the site while I was under precautionary um, staying at home uh, on account of, the, uh, of Beacon Hill being the plague centre of the universe just at the moment. Uh, although I hadn't, it turns out that I had no, uh, no contacts who... Um, managed to catch the virus, but uh, we didn't know that then. First, the first point is that the um, upper way moves all the time. 
I mean, not instantly, but you know, over the pe periods of time, it moves quite considerably. And uh, at Tilford Bridge, where, where people have been studying this for quite a long time before they decided that actually the monks had had 750 years and it needed to be rebuilt, uh, there's been a movement of more than 20 feet over a relatively, you know, sort of a couple of decades. And that was um, picked up when they were preparing to do the work on the bridge, and they found two additional Georgian arches that they didn't know were there, even. Uh, and, and that's the extent to which things move. So uh, all the time that I've been a county councillor representing the West Western villages, this has been a matter of discussion. Uh, and I have to say that having sat through all the discussions that have gone on, I, I think this is a very um, acceptable proposal to deal with the issues. It, it maintains, the, uh, as has been said, the opportunity to walk along the side of the River Wave for quite a long distance uh, and following, pretty well following the contour of, of, of the, or the routing of, of the river itself with uh, a, a minimum amount of change of the overall position of, of the footpath. So you keep most of what you've got just moving yourself away from getting <coughs> to fall into the river as it, as it, if it chooses to move that way. So we, we can't say that in 25 years' time this will be right because of the, the, the amount that it does move around. But the probability is that this will give us a pretty good chance of having a long-lasting alternative route for the footpath. Uh, and so I, I'd just like to say that uh, everything that I've, I've heard over the years supports this approach. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Martin, I think you wish to speak. Uh, thank you. Um, I always think it's good to understand the sort of distances involved. I'm looking at the, uh, at the map uh, on page 47, and we're dealing with uh, primarily with A to C, which is um, apparently a distance of some 342 metres. <clears throat> the section up to where it says footbridge one brackets vulnerable to being lost appears to be relatively uncontentious um, uh, and the, the, the replacement footpath is pretty close to the definitive footpath uh, and it seems that nobody is too worried about that. It's the section beyond that up to uh, point C um, that is contentious uh, and it's a boggy area. It's a route of about 150 metres by my calculation which is relatively short um, section and um, the important thing we have to consider is in um, on page 35 in paragraph 1.10 and the last <clears throat> sentence there says the section of definitive path where it heads away from the river <clears throat> towards Fulbrick Lane is very wet and boggy at most times of the year so it is in the public interest to divert away from the section um, it's that's the crook the crux of what we're considering here uh, the ramblers are saying, uh, I think, uh, that no, we would prefer to keep that as a footpath. I'm happy to have the other footpath going the other way as well, uh, but why would we lose something which is historic? Um, and we have to, I guess, balance up the, uh, the desirability. There is uh, maintenance to be done with a footpath which is continually in difficulty. It's been closed for a long time. The parish council seem to be happy to see it go. I'm very reluctant <coughs> to see historic footpaths go, but... Um, as Mr. Harmer has said, you know, conditions change over the years and, 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 and I think we have to go with what we find. Um, I have to say again on the balance of the evidence here, uh, moving the footpath does seem to be sensible to me. Um, instead of walking 150 metres, you need to walk 250 metres, but you avoid a section of boggy land which is very difficult to maintain. I think that's a reasonable proposition and I will go with the recommendation. Any further <coughs> member comments? Okay, so um, the local committee Waverley is asked to agree that a diversion order is made under section 119 of the Highways Act 1980 <coughs> to divert public footpaths 64 and 65 Elstead as shown on drawing 3 stroke 1 stroke 8 stroke H20A and that if any objections are received and maintained to the order that it is submitted to the Secretary of State for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs for determination. May I have a show of hands, please? First of all, those for the recommendation. Thank 
you. Those against the recommendation? None. And those abstaining from voting? Uh, none. Thank you. Good, right. We move on. So, um, item 10, Colin, thank you for sitting through our local matters. Um, Colin is going to talk to us about um, sort of general infrastructure plans for Surrey, and I'd like to welcome him and thank you very much for giving up his time to come to this meeting today. Thank you, Victoria. It's always a pleasure to sit through local interest because it's the county is so different, you know, and rural conversations that are going on here are very different to the conversations I hear in Spelthorne and Elmbridge. <laughs> so there, there's a, there's quite a variance across the county. So it's quite nice to, to, to get invited. I mean, even where I sit in Woking, you know, having I think in the, since 2013 we may have had one footpath conversation, maybe two. So it's quite nice to hear the detail and hear some of the local passion around them. So it's always interesting. Um, so infrastructure study, where are we, where are we going, where have we been? So uh, the last infrastructure study for Surrey was done back in 2015 and passed in 2016. Um, it was done in a, 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 a place in time um, where things were very different. Not a lot was done with it, if I'm going to be honest. Um, Surrey has been um, financially in a different place over the last three, few years. Um, and we're trying to change that picture. So uh, infrastructure to support development and growth is always a difficult conversation because everyone wants the infrastructure done before the housing, but you can't get the house, you can't do the infrastructure and get the money for it until you've got the housing at least agreed and going forward on the ground. And there's always that balance. But one of the key things we can do is start building a pipeline. And that's one of the things we haven't done in the past. So the first thing we've done is we've asked a company called Arup, um, some of you may have heard of, to come in and re-look at the 2015-16 study. And I was really keen that what they did was understand where we are today, because obviously things would have changed, different local plans would have come forward. So just to make sure that the roads um, and, and connectivity that is mentioned in the infrastructure study is up to date. So they will have conversations around um, with all the local boroughs and districts. They will have a look at all the local plans. They will see where um, the current, uh, any development around uh, industry is going on, where there are, uh, where housing developments are going on, and then look at the connectivity between all of those. And infrastructure is more than just roads. It's looking about how do we connect things? How do we connect things, whether it's bus, it's rail, um, and also more importantly these days is obviously footpath and cycling and looking at the whole infrastructure study we're putting together. Once we've got that study pulled together, we will then start to build, um, understand and prioritise what's going on. You know, a big, a big area um, around here that's obviously got housing going on is sort of Cranley, Dunsfold, a lot of those big areas. Um, always been a bugbear of mine that we haven't looked at what needs to be going down on there, and I know I've made some friends and enemies in some of the things I've said on them points, but actually, sometimes you just have to shake the tree and just see where you need to go and what you can do. Um, we're still working on it. We're still pulling it together. That infrastructure should be with me and on my desk and cleared by, I hope, sort of June time. In the meantime, I've got officers working on looking at our priorities going forward. That will then be fed into it, and we can start developing some of these schemes. Now, the issue being, most of the most some of these schemes can cost anywhere between. 40 and, a, and 200 million pounds to develop, depending on what sort of infrastructure you're putting in place. And you have to bid for the money. We haven't got that sort of money. You haven't got that sort of money from developer funds. We have to bid for it. But the problem is you need to have a pipeline of schemes on the shelf, which is where we've failed in the past a little bit, in not having the money. The problem being is to put a scheme together. If you want to put a £100 million scheme together, the chances are it'll cost you a million pounds before you put a spade in the game. And then you can put it on the shelf and forget about it until someone offers you some money for it. So it's quite a bit of money. If you think about all the pinch points and developments across Surrey, there's quite a lot of investment in these doing in that. But we're now stepping up to that. We realise that we need to be in that game, we need to be playing that game to, to actually start to do that work. So 
we're putting all that together. Um, I haven't got all the answers for you today, but I'm happy to take questions on possibilities and look at options. Um, what's really important to me is, is local feedback on what's going on um, and understanding local priorities. One of the things we tried to do is really under, you know, in the past, when you've got, you've got a housing development over there and you've got either a mainland station or where people work, so how do you get people from A to B in a car? Actually, we need to think differently. We need to challenge some of that. You know, I'm, I'm a car person. I'm old. I'm, I'm actually, my background is actually motor trade. So, um, but, but actually, we need to be thinking differently. People, you know, if you look, talk to young people today, they don't want a driving licence. They want to be able to get from A to B without getting into a car. They want to use their uh, chip and pin card and go by public transport and all the rest of it, which is why we lose so many of the young people out of our county. So we need to be thinking differently. As I say, it's going to take time, it's going to take money. I haven't got all the answers, but I'm happy to take questions on that going forward. Dr. Bailey. Thank you, Chairman, uh, and thank you, Colin, for coming along on this. Uh, I'm just a bit concerned from what you said that I, I couldn't see in your sort of programme up to June where the consultation with the public or with members was. Uh, you know, I, I thought if someone's going to come into my division, and I'm sure colleagues would feel the same, we'd want to be well in there, well ad in advance of, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of this study. Um, and I think it would also be helpful to know, I mean, you talked about very big projects of 40 to 100 million, but what about the smaller ones? There might be like a road bridge or something that uh, is single lane that could be doubled, uh, you know, something costing perhaps two or three million. I mean, are we looking at those sorts of things as well? Um, and, uh, you know, so a little bit more, or are we really looking at, you know, major, major schemes and obviously the one from uh, my division and, and uh, uh, I guess Victoria's as well really is around the 281, uh, which uh, has kind of defeated attempts, I think, to, uh, uh, to see how we can possibly make it uh, more acceptable. Um, consulting members, I think bringing the study together is not the right time to consult. I mean, we need to understand what all the, where everything is. I think the time to consult members is when we start to prioritise that pipeline is the time to have that conversation. What we, but we, what we need to understand at the moment is, is the paperwork that's on the ground. So where the developments are and what's going on. So then once we've got all that information, when we start to build the possibilities and pipelines and the connectivity, that's the point to bring the local interest into it because the, the infrastructure study will not tell us what we're going to do. It will tell us where the problems are. And that's, that's, the, that's some of that background. But then how, opening them, them conversations going forward is where we would get that local interest. On the major and minor, you're absolutely right. Um, there, is, there is a rough split in the way the system works at the moment that anything over five million will come into the transport development team, anything under five million goes to the highway team. But one thing we are going to try and do going forward, um, and one thing we've been lacking is some expertise in project management, um, in, in, in bringing infrastructure projects forward. So we will, we will bring in some project managers that will work with, with Frank and the local highways managers about what's going on on some of the smaller stuff, because actually there will be some linking and that together of some of that. So you're absolutely right to identify. I'm talking about the bigger monies, but there is some smaller bits and pieces. I mean, and you've mentioned the 281 because actually there isn't a big fix um, that wouldn't cause many, many problems. So, you know, is there some little bits along that way that could ease it, but then could we put some public transport options in to take the cars off of the road as well? And that's where the bigger picture we, we need to look at. That's another debate. <laughs> uh, could I just explain that... Uh, the chairman has uh, yeah, the chairman has uh, a daughter who is not feeling very well, and so she thought it best that she went and looked after her. Mm. Uh, actually, I was quite surprised to see her come this morning because I, I was aware that the child had not been too well overnight. But uh, there you go, uh, Mrs. Coburn. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I think we're all probably going to say the same thing, but in slightly different ways. Uh, I mean, I was quite cheered by what you said. You mentioned the passion. And, of course, at parish and town level, that's all we have. We don't get any allowance. You know, we do it for the goodness of our, out of the goodness of our hearts and the love that we have for our local area. 
And I think this is something that we all feel doesn't get fed in because people th somehow think we're all irrational because we're passionate about something. But we're passionate about it because we know it, we live it, we breathe it. Um, you mentioned getting out of the car. The car, it really annoys me, sorry, sort of... Uh, or, or, past um, uh, uh, focus on the car because in Farnham we have a station that's cut off by the car from our town and you know it's these things I know what people want because I've got children I've got grandchildren I did in the previous uh, not very long I have two mothers so I mean I used to hear on a daily basis the difficulties of living in the town and it's when as you say this gets fed in because if it gets fed in too far, I don't mean my views, I'm talking about the town's views. You know, we just had our neighbourhood plan review last night was the referendum. And, you know, that has been eight, nine years of community work. So, you know, there's a great sort of body of knowledge, interest, passion, all there waiting to be tapped. And, you know, it is something that we want to feed in very early into any process. You know, you're talking... 40,000 people, you know, a huge town. The very first thing somebody said to me when we started the neighbourhood plan was what about the infrastructure? And I actually had to say, you know, that you're talking absolute perfect common sense, but unfortunately we can't take that first. We have to do everything else. And the public think we're all batty because, you know, obviously you get the infrastructure in place before you put the houses. So, um, <laughs> you know, it's... It's a very, all I'm saying, and I know everybody else is going to say the same, for goodness sake, get the local input in there because it's absolutely priceless. Thank you. And, and the first step, if I may say so, Carol, uh, sorry, um, Colin, is uh, that here you have the people who represent electorally, the, the people who have that feel, and we don't use it. And I, I'd like to have the same message passed across to officers. I don't think our county council officers use the resource of the councillors, both county and district level, as they could. So, you know, any more you'd like to? I would like to thank you, first of all, for, for actually using the word past, because that's the message I'm trying, <laughs> really trying to get across, that we are changing. I've, I've got to be, be honest, before I started the, the highway part of this, so two and a half years ago, um, I had never come across a parish. In Woking, we don't have parishes. But actually, I've become very passionate about parishes. I understand um, the role they play, their link into the borough and district, up to the county. So I, I do understand all of that. And we will absolutely, you know, all of those local plans, all of that hard work that's been done over the past years will be fed in to, um, as our leader commonly likes to put it, a coffee grinder to actually get the results out of the other end. But it is that, it is that way of, of bringing all of that excellent work that's been going on all the stuff and all the local knowledge you know what we don't want to use is that local knowledge so you, you have my absolute assurance that the the local knowledge will absolutely be fed into where we're where we're going on with this and you know you you mentioned that i'm sure someone else is going to ask me questions about farnham absolutely about getting all the right people around the table to have those conversations is absolutely where we're where we want to take that and, and actually what we're, what we're going to set up and do in Farnham, what we really want to do is use that as an exemplar about how we, we work and cure some of these issues all together as all the different levels of authorities and different people, the businesses, the residents, all the things around the table that we need to have. T talking of which, uh, the, after the meeting's closed, while I think of it, if the uh, people who attended the Farnham discussion the other, the other day would like to get together with me, I'll tell you what you all said in summary. Uh, that includes you, yes. <laughs> um, OK, uh, Mr Spence was next. Thank you. As you know, Colin, you are my favourite Cabinet member, although Mary Lewis is competing hard to try to take <laughs> your crown off you. Um, and Carol has covered some of what I said. Um, and in infrastructure um, within the context that you deal with it may or may not cover highways, I don't quite know, but obviously that is the big issue in Farnham, as you know. And the board that has been put together is very important and very warmly welcomed um, as a great step forward. But some of these issues are very, very time sensitive, particularly the stuff that needs to be done linking up to Brightwell's and to Woolmaid, and the difficulty, of course, again, as Carol's pointed out, is that resident consultation on exactly what we do is critical because people are so cynical after years of inaction that now that the wind has changed, 
although I'm not sure I quite see you in the Mary Poppins role, but maybe somewhere <laughs> around there, um, to get people on board and positive about what we want to try to do is incredibly important. So in a sense, I'm simply going to underline the point that Carol's made and also to say the um, other areas outside the centre that will be affected, like the Upper Hill Road and so forth, where I'm determined to get trucks off it, no matter what Frank says, and 20 miles an hour down, you know, the, 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 in, in the centre, and the trucks off Folly Hill. The, the, there are those areas outside the, the, the centre of the town that are also affected by what we do. I know you're on it. You've been a great advocate for it, and I, and I thank you for that. But it is very important that we, we take this through um, quickly, properly, and, and with action and not just talking. And that's the key. The key is action and delivery, as well as looking, you know, the, the end result of this will be a 25-year plan. But actually, while we're doing that, let's look for local wins or things we can trial to try and draw that picture. Because modelling will take you so far but actually trials of bits and pieces will get you another thing. But actually, we've already appointed a project manager. I had a meeting with the lady yesterday, mm -hmm. um, you'll all meet. One of the other things we're looking at doing, just to give you an insight of where we're going with this and the exemplar we're blowing, although we'll have the board up here, we're also looking at what's called an LLF, which is a, a local, I've just looked it up, a local liaison forum, which will be chaired lower around where we'll take some of that information and bring some of that in. So we're looking at putting all this together and making it right. As I say, the project manager will be the key to this. I've met her from a company called Arcadia. I met with her yesterday. She'll be coming along and will be leading on this and will be the, the hub of bringing all this and actually working with the county officers of bringing all that together. But you're absolutely right about what David said about as well, about how do we... Um, using the local knowledge and the local tools. I sit in front of members. We, they do a course called Working with Elected Members. And one of the things I say at the beginning is we are a local tool. We are something for you to be used to make your life easier because we have the knowledge of what goes on locally. So I drum that in every day of the week. And, and I think it's important that we, we, we as, as the work we do, we do exactly the same as that and live by that. So action and... and Long-term planning with short-term action is, is absolutely on our agenda. Mrs Barton. Well, thank you. Well, I'm, I'm sort of excited to hear there's a, a wind of change. I think that's really, really needed. And I hope the wind of change takes us in a very green direction, because I think we have to. And um, I've been part with, um, with Andy and, and, and some others on the ta task group at Surrey level, looking at the, the new strategy going forwards. And it seems to me, looking at the challenge Surrey faces, and I know you've probably you, you were um, seen the Leeds baseline data, the challenge we have as a county um, to reduce our emissions is absolutely massive. And infrastructure and how we plan going forward is absolutely critical to that. And if you look, Leeds came up um, with a sort of top 10 wins, really, in terms of reducing CO2 emissions, particularly with um, associated improvements for air pollution as well. And the top three were getting people out of private cars into more active travel. And so um, while I know that there are maybe a bits of road that need looking at, I would really urge you to go down that green, that green route. Um, often smaller amounts of money can actually yield more. Um, and I think I wanted to join with the health agenda because actually that's a real missed trick. It's not just about time spent in, in a car, length of travel. It's all about that wider improving the health and um, well-being of our societies. So, um, yeah, I'm really hoping that this is going to be green as well as um, a whole a sort of paradigm shift, really, because I think we need to lead the way in that. Um, one thing I'm really interested in is the connectivity over the border. Hazelmere, where I represent, is sort of on the edge, and I think it's really important that we're not just in a silo of the county. Um, some, uh, looking at new partnerships, um, community rail partnerships, for example, are really interesting, the links um, in terms of intermodality between buses and um, trains and, uh, and intermediate transport. Um, and also, I don't know if you've met with um, Vic Mitchell. I'd like to line up a meeting with you. He's this rail expert who's got all sorts of ideas around um, Cranley and the um, uh, previous, uh, any opportunities for light rail. Anyway, I'll, I'll take that up with you um, outside here. But anyway, I'm really excited to see your plan, Colin, and I hope you'll work with us all because our communities are telling us they want better walking and cycling connectivity. Thank you. The gentleman on the row, I think I've spoken to and had email conversation with because yeah. we both did a radio interview, I think. Yes, that's a bit, yeah. On, yeah, yeah. so I, I, we've, I've already yeah. made connection with okay, him and had a couple of communications. Okay. Um, you're right, and, and, and what sometimes annoys me is 
with the green agenda. It's an agenda over here, and it's not. It's actually in and through everything we do. It's not a separate agenda. It's actually part of everything we do and needs to be entwined into it. Um, as does health. You're absolutely right in bringing up health because, you know, one of the biggest determinants of health is the societies and communities we create. So it's through planning, through borough planning. Health is a massive part of that in what yeah. we put down on the ground. Through infrastructure, so health and, and environment is absolutely wound into everything we do and needs to be taken into that. You know, we're taking other steps at the moment in looking at creating and enforcing of bus lanes. Because actually, if you want to get people out of their cars and into the buses, you must create a bus service that people want to use and is efficient. So first thing to do is create some bus lanes, but also looking at money into buses and how we can improve the service. Now, that may not be in, in, in sort of big 52-seater buses going around, but perhaps it's around local electric community buses that connect people. And you mentioned um, uh, transport hubs, rail stations. Actually, how do you get people from point A to the hub so they get their onward journey rather than trying to take them all the way? So we're, all of that is being worked on at the moment. It, it's a, it, you know... It's almost a piece of work that hasn't been done in any depth. So it's a massive piece of work. We're getting expertise in. I like the guy from Leeds University, some of the ideas. I didn't like the bills he put on it and the prices he put <laughs> on some of the ideas. But he was re really encouraging. But, um, yeah, so all of that is being wound into it. It's, it's a massive piece of work. We, we put some real... I mean, some of the, the stuff we're doing on the local stuff we're trying to do in Farnham, we've really set some fast... Um, time scales, the infrastructure study we're doing across Surrey, we've put some, we're putting pressure on as much as we can, but we have to allow these people to do the job properly. Mr. Gray. Thank you. And uh, Colin, I hope you will become my favourite portfolio holder when you do your plan. Um, like yourself, I've had 20 years in the motor industry and I, I certainly would not have kept my job if I'd actually put the infrastructure in after I put forward the, the development. One has to go to the other. I know it's not practical to put it in, but at least when we put some of the development in, we should have a plan for the infrastructure. We, we should know what the gaps are. Um, I mean, Surrey has approved the Waverley Plan. Surrey basically supported Dunsfold Park. Um, I note your comments about parishes. Well, the east of the borough is all parishes. We don't have a town. We don't have a Farnham because 90% of, of, not 90, but about 70% of the conversation in this chamber is Farnham. There is a population over the east of the borough which is going to take 40% of Waverley's housing in its plan, 40%. It's got a village called Cranley that's going to double in size. It's got one road where you can put two cars past each other down its length. One road only. All the other routes. There's no east-west route. And as far as having traffic basically cut off my railway station, I'd love a railway station. We don't have one. Um, we need somewhere like the eastern part of Waverley to feature quite high in your investigation. I'm very concerned about the government pumping lots and lots of money up north. I don't, uh, I don't have a problem with the policy. What I do have is a concern of what they're going to leave behind. If we're going to have the investment up there, then they need the houses up there. We have to have a balanced programme, and we certainly would look towards your infrastructure um, suggestions and welcome it very, very much. Welcome local participation. And thank you for letting me have my little rant. Others have heard it before. <laughs> You're absolutely right, and I do totally understand, and I've read up and made myself understand Cranley, Dunsfold, the whole area around there. And it's one of the things I've pushed around. You know, In our current infrastructure study, that's not featured at all. We need to make for the bits that are being left behind. So absolutely support you in that. As I say, haven't got all the answers, but I know the questions, and I'm absolutely asking them and pushing on that going forward. Um, better rail connections. You know, I, 
I don't think we're going to get... I think the North is going to get a lot of the, the row money to go across east to west. Um, but let us think outside the, the box and think, OK, we don't want cars. We don't want... We're not going to get heavy row. What can we do on light row? What we can we do on community? <coughs> what, what else can we do? You know, and, let, you know, that's the... And one of the things that's been... Um, muted and I've been saying it a while and I notice now a few other people are picking up the thread is what used to be the old rail line could we put an electric tram or could we put a guided bus corridor up there between the two or something like that so and still keep the cycling and walking up the same avenue so all going to cost money but actually that's not an ex you know one of the pe one of the things we've done in the past that's going to cost too much money what, why should we do the work because we're never going to get the money to do it actually now we need to say right let's get the money because let's create the money to at least design understand and come up with some solutions so if someone does come up with some money the leveling up conversation is a big one we're lobbying heavily on that um, with our local mps as well as with ministers that we meet with because actually the, the <coughs> argument about I, I totally agree that actually we need to spread the, the load up and down the country they need some investment up north but don't forget the south do not, because this is where the money is created. The, outside of London, the South East is where the money comes from. For you to be able to send it out north, do not take your eye off the ball. Because if you cut off your funding stream, and you know, if you look at Surrey's economy, my other hat is economic development, we are stalling. We are going backwards. On our, on our growth figures, we are, you know, there's a danger that businesses will start to struggle and they'll move up north and actually all the money will come away from here before the north is built and we'll end up in a in a in a in a recession or whatever it's going to be but so they really need to keep they've given us assurances this is nobody left behind including the south we'll wait and see mr mcleod <clears throat> thank you chairman uh, Colin, uh, it's nice to see you here, and I'd like to say, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the interest that you've personally shown in Farnham. The fact that you came down for the whole day to, to look round with Stephen and myself, um, that's very welcome. I'm not sure whether you're my favourite Cabinet member or not, to be honest. <laughs> I'm not sure I've got one, actually, but uh, if I have to nominate somebody, I think I'll go for Tim Oliver, because although you're very important, He's even more important as, as the leaders, and Stephen and I can cover all the bases there. <laughs> the, the, the thing that I wanted to ask you perhaps about and to explain a little bit about is that I think we've all begun to hear recently of this new, relatively new organisation called Transport for the South East. They, they seem to... Surrey's got a transport, an infrastructure plan, a transport plan, but this organisation is covering the whole of the South East, and I believe that you're our Surrey's representative on that organisation. So I've taken the trouble to spend time looking at their website, and I'd recommend other people to look at it, actually. It's a very interesting website. Their overall objective, as declared, is to help double the economy of the South East by 2050, which is a pretty ambitious objective. And they say improving all the communication links and the road systems in, in the South East is going to be a very big part of that. And that's all very commendable. Um, one thing that perhaps slightly concern me or worries me about this organisation. If you, if you, they seem to be based in Lewis. They seem to be very much East Sussex orientated. A lot of the senior people on, 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 the, on the body, both from the council side and the office side, seem to have come from East Sussex. And when you look at all the plans, the, a lot of them seem to be orientated towards the south of, of the region. You know, we've got lots of new roads along the south coast. And if you look at the 10... Um, bids that have already been made to government on what they call smaller projects, which is up to 30 million. Uh, I don't think there's very many of them in Surrey, although I believe that in terms of the later list that's coming along of the bigger projects, the Hickley's Corner uh, development in Farnham is going to figure. Um, so I guess my general question is, what's the importance of this body? How, how, how you know, where does Surrey link in with it? And where, where are we going to get a fair share of the money in the the priorities from it and so on. It's just a general question. You're a, a representative, so maybe you can explain a little bit more about how the, the importance of the body and how Surrey should fit in with it all. Thank you. Um, first of all, leadership of Transport for the South East, you're right. The leader of East Sussex is, the, is the, also the chair, but also the vice chair is um, a councillor from Reading. So it is spread across the region. Um, I've, I've really sort of sat myself on the board and really 
hammered the the sorry picture to bring us up but actually we need to be producing something that they can use the future of tfse as of the leps is unknown until the government makes some really decisions about you know there's a regional transport uh, bodies now for covering all of the country but there's there's only the ones that have got the mayoral um, areas that have got statutory status the others haven't yet um, transport for the southeast main piece of work at the moment is um, on the major road networks um, which is the stuff that you've looked up and you've seen um, and what I've been prioritizing um, the, the three or four major schemes within Surrey because they're, they're the large local majors um, which Hickley's Corner comes under so where is transport in its transport for southeast in its future I don't really know the answer to that it's the case of being around the table one thing it does do is someone mentioned over here about cross-border conversations that's the place where it happened you know I, I, I sit on there with um, deputy leaders or leaders from West Sussex from Hampshire from Kent and actually I, I build relationships the deputy leader of Hampshire I meet now once a month we have an afternoon session together going around what we're all doing and what we're working together on so it's a good place to build relationships and network there's some work coming through it and it's releasing some money and the first lot of the um the major road networks have just been announced unfortunately we didn't get anything in it i think the only one that was in it was in hampshire uh, the a329 i think if memory says right but that may be wrong um but actually as are on the list and I'm, I'm i'm now what i need to do is create outline business cases in more detail so we can actually look at releasing some of the money as i say i've got hickley's corner i've got the a22 i've got three two or three throughout sorry that i need to champion and um, which is what i am doing mr, mr. martin um, thank you. I won't compete for adoration, but um, I would note that I used to have Colin's job, and when, the, when I was in the job, the economy of Surrey was booming, uh, Colin. <laughs> um, <Thank> you, <laughs> the, um, and, and much of what I wanted to say has been said. Uh, of course, the issue is that we put in all the houses before the infrastructure gets there. Somewhere like Godalming now is gridlock every morning and every evening because you cannot get from Milford, which I represent, through Godalming, which I represent, and beyond, uh, and it's a very narrow road, impossible to put a bus lane in, um, and what we, linked, what we need is a whole set of linked traffic lights, uh, which currently cost hundreds of thousands of pounds, which I can't understand why, but it's um, something like that which we need uh, to sort out, uh, at least sort that out. Uh, but the pains of Godalming from overdevelopment have been very intense. Uh, the most significant uh, pain is Dunsfold, uh, you're aware of that. That will have implications again for my patch, which is Milford. The nearest mainland station to Dunsfold is Milford. Uh, the thought of uh, cross-country travel on the roads there uh, between Dunsfold and Milford uh, and the extra impact on Milford is unthinkable. Uh, and therefore, the A281 is of huge concern. I have long dreamed of a Horsham to Woking improved A281, bypassing Bramley, bypassing uh, Guildford, going across the A3 and up, up onto the M25. That would be fantastic. But, of course, we may have to look at greener things. And I think the thoughts of a light railway connection into Cranley and then on to Dunsfold may be the sort of answer that we need. But we need some radical thinking. And the, the, the monies that we have released or have been capable of being released by developments don't in any way begin to scratch the, scratch the thing at all. You know, even the Section 106 money that you might get from a substantial development like Dunsford doesn't anything like deal with the transport problems. Uh, and, and therefore, we put the transport, uh, the, the, we put the infrastructure in, sorry, we put the housing in, we just don't get the, the infrastructure right. And it's an accumulation of 50 years of that as an issue, which we now have in Surrey. And the difficulty with government and proving that we need it is that they always want to look forward and say, what will you unlock rather than look back to solve the past problems? Good luck in the role. Uh, but, uh, and I was instrumental in setting up Transport South East. It's absolutely vital that we're around the table. Uh, but of course, we are competing with every other part of the South East. And the South East, as you rightly say, isn't getting enough money. Thank you. I can now blame you for what's gone on before, Peter. Thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. And actually, you know, the people sitting in this room the councillors are going to make some of the difficult decisions about what we need to do. You know, I sat in this committee when it was at a different location and I happened to mention about or ask the question about a bypass that goes from the A281 across. You wouldn't believe the emails I got about picking roads and connections across our countryside. And so at some point, 
there's some difficult decisions to make. I'm not saying that's going to be the one. I'm just using it as an example. Please don't carry on writing to me, whoever you were. But um, there, there is some difficult decisions that we, we all need to sit down as local community leaders, at both the county, the borough and the parish level, about how do we cure some of these problems. Even if we had the money, you know, the A281, if I had an open checkbook on it, I don't know that I'd cure it because actually I'd start knocking down houses and buildings to open up pinch points and things. So I think there's some difficult conversations to go on as we go forward. Yeah. Mr. Ramsdale. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Colin, I'm delighted that we're addressing planning our infrastructure, at least to an extent, ahead of the development so that when funds become available, some of them to be used as match funding, we can make those bids for be it HIF, LEP, um, the MRN network monies. Um, what I would like to do is just check that a few things are in the coffee grinder, including some of the green beans. Um, I'm, I'm delighted that uh, Council Spence had the opportunity to raise the issue of the Upper Hale Road. Now, we have a significant problem in Prob Farnham of how traffic gets from the M3 to cut across to things like the, the Hogsback. Answer at the moment seems to be it tries to come through the middle of the town centre or alternatively down other residential roads. When there's perfectly um, good quality, dual carriageway, 70 mile per hour roads that they could use. If only the sat -navs took them that way and the instructions and, and the willingness was there. Um, Hickley's Corner you mentioned. Um, there's, there's a model in Farnham Town Council at the moment that doesn't show one massive important layer of how we see transport today. It doesn't show the pedestrian movements and it doesn't show the cycle lanes. I, I, I do hope that when we get that dusted off with the encouragement of transport for the southeast. We, we include those two very important groups of people because things like air quality are massively influenced by people not driving. And not driving means having the routes for people to do the safer alternatives. Um, of course, my hobby horse, and the one I really want to make sure is, is in, the co in the coffee grinder, is that A325 where you've been kind enough to come down and attend um, public meetings with me and with members of Recklesham Village Voice. Um, now, we've got a, a low railway bridge which will can open the top of the trucks if they, they don't know what their height is. We're in a conservation area. We've got schools within hundreds of yards of that main A road. We've got shops on it. And you'd be taking your own life in your own hands if you tried to cut across the road at the wrong time. Cycling on it is almost verboten by parents to any of the youngsters trying to do it. Um, that needs massive attention. I do hope that's uh, fairly high up your list for the Farnham Project Board and the liaison group that will um, come from that. Um, I, I won't apologise to anybody for, for going on about the A31 around Farnham and the, and the, and the other roads around Farnham, because to, to be frank, I think Farnham and the A31, and that A31 doesn't go round Farnham, it goes through the middle of it, or at least slightly to one side, um, has the congestion now that people fear will happen on the A281 and other roads in Surrey in the future. So please, can we get that cracking first, even if it's um, not the scheme that everybody wanted, because not everybody will agree all of the time. But thank you, Colin. Thanks for being here. Yes, is the answer. Oh, everything will be put in, especially cycling, walking, public transport, buses, and maybe some car stuff as well. But, and as some of the things we will do there will be a negative impact before there's a positive impact. And we will probably create more congestion from cars because we're making better access for public transport and stuff. And hopefully that will force people out of their cars. So be careful what's coming down the road, but absolutely we're, we're, we're taking it all on board uh, to, to make it happen. Mr Baker. Um, thank you. Um, I hardly know where to begin. Um, I will address the matter of the culture that I've experienced for uh, uh, the Surrey County Council culture that I've experienced for years. Um, I will say it once more. I was um, uh, voted on to Waverley in 1995 and I came off in 2003. And I have ha not had a good experience with county starting from 1995, really, until the present day. Um, I am really glad if that is going to change. I have never had the impression that 
my area and the concerns of my area, which is Whitley Parish. I represent Milford Ward, but I take on very much the overall concerns of Whitley Parish. I don't feel that I've been listened to. And you have actually heard questions about Milford this morning in this very chamber. They need to be addressed. There are problems which are manifesting themselves and have done so for years at Station Lane, which is part of this strategic cross route from Cranley in the east and the A3 in the west. Um, you've heard, this is a theme that has been coming up here over and over again. Milford is in the middle of it. And it is, in fact, a transport hub because it, Milford provides an access to the A3, but the railway station is miles away. Uh, it is not a happy arrangement. We do not want the community destroyed in order to make things work better, but they do have to work better. Um, Milford has been given an allocation of 480 new houses to satisfy the housing need here, um, which, as you know, um, includes the unmet need by Woking, 500 houses overall for Waverley. Um, I just, I really don't know how we are going to manage when those 480 houses are built. There is uh, one planning application which has been granted for Milford Golf Course for 200 houses. I don't think they will get that many on the site and we haven't had the, um, the detailed application in yet. But there is an awful lot going on and you've heard Councillor Martin say that there is daily congestion on the A3100 from Milford into Godalming, which causes a lot of problem. There are tailbacks on the A3 every morning in the rush hour going up to the hog's back. There is so much strategic stuff that has just been ignored. And we now, we, we have uh, an established problem in Milford, <coughs> which currently affects people who are passing through, as, you, as you've heard, and also the residents, and that is the bridge over the Ock in Station Lane and the blocked culverts. I don't think there is any excuse for leaving the culverts blocked. And actually, we, we just don't feel that the County Council reaches out to us. So if you can con actually consider these things and take them on board in your, in your project planning, we'd be very grateful. But there are still not uh, smaller things that need to be done now because the projects present now, the problems present now. Um, as regards uh, public transport and the use of the car, we are never going to do without roads. There were tracks in the Bronze Age, and goodness knows how far before that. So they are absolutely essential. When I chaired Partnership Committee, which was about the year 2000, it was the predecessor to this committee, and the chairmanship rotated. That might be something that could be taken on board in the new version of Good. the local committee. Um, and we actually, did, we, we actually um, looked at a study that had been done in Holland uh, for the use of community buses for villages, because obviously the problems in villages are not the same as the problems in the towns. And uh, it was thought that maybe minibus services would supply the need in the Dutch villages. It didn't work out because, basically, of the cost. It was decided it wasn't feasible. 
we are now 20 odd years down the line and maybe we ought to look at that because the bus services are not uh, anything near providing a replacement for the private car. So I leave you with those thoughts. Okay. Uh, folks, we're in danger of losing the parking item and the highways items, which I dare say some people would like to discuss. So, um, Mr. Hyman. We'll, we'll, try and, to we'll, we'll try and keep this <coughs> fairly brief. Yes, the, the, uh, Councillor Gray and Councillor Martin have um, talked about the problems that, the, that we've got. Uh, there's a misconception here which I'd like to address briefly, if I may, and this is the infrastructure first problem, where um, uh, the, the problem, of course, that you have in your areas is that you just don't have enough nitrogen dioxide in the air. We're very, very lucky in Farnham. We've got loads and loads of nitrogen dioxide, and that means that uh, under Section 84 to 86 of the Environment Act 1995, we're entitled to have an air quality action plan, uh, which has to put in the infrastructure uh, before we uh, make things worse, supposedly. But of course, that hasn't been adhered to ever. Um, so, you know, what, what I'd like to see myself certainly is for that, um, for Parliament to be given the um, it, what it's entitled to in law. Um, 80, sections 84 to 86 say that uh, where the county council is not providing the infrastructure necessary to address the problem and not providing the solutions, um, then uh, Waverley Borough Council, the Borough Council, is able to, through the Secretary of State, uh, force those actions to be taken. And we really need to see that uh, done because we've had this problem since 2005 when we had our air quality management areas uh, um, designated. Uh, since for the past 15 years, we basically, we've had a problem with our councillors and our officers not putting, in, not, not putting into effect the law properly in respect of uh, finding the solutions. Um, <coughs> in, in, I've noticed that if we move on to, and hopefully we will be able to, move on to page 98 at some point, um, it says Waverley Local Transport Strategy and says we're going to be, um, we've, we've got a new strategy coming up which is a bit like another L, L, a local transport plan, LTP 4 or 5 is it? I don't know what sort of number we'll be getting to. Um, I'm just wondering, is what you're talking about at the moment, um, uh, Councillor Kemp, is that the same as, or does it, does it tie in with, with the local transport strategy that's on page 98 at 2.9.6 to 2.9.9? Or are, are all these things being done separately? Because to me, they should all fit in together. Our air quality action plan should be addressed in these. It, it should all be in front of us and should have been for years. And I'm, I'm just wondering whether we're just going to be finding co various odd committees um, coming up w eventually with plans and saying, oh, but we've got no money, despite the fact our government's saying, yeah, we're going to invest in this stuff. Can, can we have what we're entitled to in law, please? Thank you very much. Mr Merriweather. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'm happy to associate myself, I think, pretty much with everything that's been said so far. Um, it's a very refreshing discussion. Um, I'm going to have to spend some time containing my expectations. Uh, the, um, uh, the, um, the, the, the question came up, uh, Councillor Martin, I think, touched on Section 106, uh, and I'm particularly concerned about the smaller and medium-sized projects that are typically funded from Section 106, and particularly um, CIL, um, things like cycle uh, highways and cycle paths. Um, I sit on the CIL groups at Waverley and at Farnham. Um, we're fairly well advanced in what we think uh, the system is going to look like, but I, I don't recall ever having heard anything from Surrey about how prepared they are for CIL. Presumably it's going to engage um, in a, an entirely different process of consultation because you will be bidding to Waverley and Farnham for monies for some of these projects. Um, so um, I'd welcome your thoughts on that. OK, I'll make some notes, so I hope I capture it all. Um, Milford, I am aware of. I know where it is. Um, I understand the, the problems with the A3, but actually the A3 is Highways England, and there's another problem. But actually, we do try and sit down with them to get them to address their problem. But RIS2 has just been released, and the A3 doesn't feature in it, which is really annoying. So that's another whole problem we need to deal with. You're right about too many cars. We have too many cars on the road. If you, but if you look at it, you know, I've started driving in the 70s. That my father had one, we had one family car. Nowadays, everyone's got two, three, four family cars. That's part of the problem, is, is we've got a lifestyle change and we need to, we need to change it back. 
um, which is going to take some, some change in people's attitudes. So I, I totally agree with you, but absolutely the infrastructure study will look at local connectivity problems and what and the villages and t small areas that are across there that will be affected. So absolutely we're looking at that. Um, infrastructure, in, well, the air quality plan is obviously a borough thing, but that will feed into it. Um, as to we must provide the infrastructure, it's not part, it, 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 we haven't got the money for it, we have to bid for it, we, and that, that's a fact of life. Um, and it is where we are, I understand where you're sowing. The local plan absolutely ties in with the county plan. They will be formulated together. Part of our, and our county plan will be the sum of 12 parts. So it will be the sum of the 11 boroughs and districts and the connectivity across the borders that we need to look at and build in as well. So absolutely, it will all tie in and be worked to, to, through together. Um, and in fact, our officers work with your borough officers on actually putting some of that together to make sure it all ties in from the bottom up as well as the top down. Um, but we, you know, we'd love to do the infrastructure first. We'd love to work on it, but it is that hard work. Um, you, you talked about containing your expectation. I'd rather say manage it because actually time scales, you know, this is the reality of some of this stuff is, is managing expectations. We're absolutely committed to it. But, you know, it, if I look at, I look at my own patch because I was involved in it. So I look at Woking and we got the HIF bid a year ago. That was 10 years in the making. So we have to manage expectations about putting some stuff on the ground. Obviously, the smaller stuff will, will uh, come quicker. But everything you do that it pleases you will be unhappy. Someone else will be unhappy. And we have to push through all of that as we go forward. The whole SIL conversation, I totally agree with you. That was part of what the Joint Committees was trying to, to bridge that gap. I've been told by boroughs, and I'm not going to say who, who, the SIL money is theirs and it doesn't include roads. You go away and find the money somewhere else. And I was told that by a borough. So, you know, there needs to be some stronger rules around SIL. I totally agree it should be at a local level so you can control where it goes and, and get in some... But actually, what it needs to be spent on, it, it, you know, it is supposed to be for the infrastructure. It is supposed to be from roads, for cycling, for schools, for doctor surgeries. It's supposed to come all that. So there needs to be some tighter rules around SIL. I don't think it's worked in quite how they intended. It's worked well in some ways, and I do agree Waverley's in quite a good place, but some of the other boroughs are in... We get this total hand in front of the face. It's not our problem. So there, there needs to be just some tighter understanding of that. Okay. Go on, quick. I'll be very quick. Uh, Wavell is waiting to hear from you. Sorry? Wavell is waiting to hear from you. We, 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 um, we're assuming that you'll be bidding for money for highways and for schools and other, and other things. Uh, but we're, uh, we're flying blind. I think that's the idea of the Farnham discussion. Anyway, um, I'm, that, that's it for now. By the way, congratulations on get, getting HIF in 10 years. The Hindhead Bypass took 72. <laughs> but, uh, I don't want any of you to wait that long. Anyway, so uh, I'd like to thank uh, Colin for coming along. I'm sure that started a whole lot of things that you'll be sending him emails about, I can imagine. And I'll leave you to do that. But we do need to go on to other items. Thank, thanks ever so much for coming, Colin. Can I shoot? Am I all right? Yeah, shoot. Yeah, please. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. For... No. <laughs> and that's what I'm rushing now for a necessity. As well. <laughs> okay. So we ne we now move on to item eleven, which is the uh, on street parking review. And uh, welcome to Jack Roberts, who I think quite a lot of you have had dealings with before. So you won't be surprised. Would you like to introduce your report? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Chairman. This is the 2020 Waverley Parking Review. Um, we had over 130 requests since the last review of Waverley. Um, in the report today, there's 32 proposals, six of those just for changes on the, with the traffic order only as the work's already done on the ground. Um, there's two new permit schemes being proposed, one for Red Line Lane Farnham and one for South Hill Godalming, both following petitions from residents for those schemes. Um, the other most significant proposal is new curfew times in um, the South Farnham area, um, where the hospice there are now supportive of those times following the last advertisement. Um, overall, this is intended to be a smaller review to keep Waverley reviews smaller and, and more, uh, more manageable size, which makes every stage um, easier 
and quicker, uh, including the advert uh, and the installation, most importantly. Um, everything agreed today will be advertised for 28 days later on this year. Um, so be open to comment, objection, and support responses. And happy to take any questions on what is proposed. Mr. Martin. Um, thank you uh, for that. Um, I, I'm in broad support of what's proposed here. Um, in my own patch in Godalming, South Milford and Whitley, uh, what I, the, the major concern for me is New Road in Milford, and uh, I know we have representatives from the community uh, here in the audience today uh, in, in New Road with a substantial issue of, um, of accessibility through, through uh, New Road. Uh, we have proposed um, double yellow lines. Uh, the, the community is quite anxious to get um, double yellow lines, perhaps the other side of the road. Uh, but I think uh, the reality at the moment is to move slowly uh, and to try one thing first, and then if that, uh, that doesn't work in the next review, you go a stage further. I think the problem with so much of the parking restrictions that we see often, the cure is worse than the problem itself, uh, and then we have a real issue. Uh, so I think um, I'm happy with the, the thought that we will go to consultation on double yellow lines in New Road. Um, there's a thought that that perhaps should be a single yellow line, but that's something which we can handle during the consultation. Uh, and then at the next consultation, uh, or the next review, we will then consider it again. And I think uh, steady as you go is the name of the game. But uh, for my patch, um, I'm content with the propositions. Thank you. Could, could I just say that Mr. Martin makes a, an important point, that this is a proposal to put this out into public domain for comment. Uh, and there's another round where we consider uh, such comments and uh, you know, to a greater extent, uh, lesser extent, depending on the comments in question. But, Mr Chairman, you can't, you can't then expand from there. You can only accept what you've got or go down a step. You can't sort of say, oh, I'd want something else apart from this. So it's very, un very important we understand the, what the consultation... You as part of this review, you can't. You have, to, you have to deal with that in a different way. Mr Hyman, you're next. Thank you. Yes, in view of the time constraints that's run upon us now, I was going to say exactly the same thing. If you turn to put 4.1 and 4.3 on pages 57 and 58, members, then uh, you'll see it's up for advertising in the spring, and then there's 28 days for residents to comment. So that's the important thing. We don't need to go into any of the details today. If I may just, though, to, to perhaps save other members from saying so, um, to, to run through the Farnham issues, Woodbourne Nutbourne Junction is great because uh, uh, there's a lot more like that around the town that need sorting out where it's sight lines and that sort of thing that are the problem. Thorold Road, all good. Everybody supports that. It's good for residents. I don't know about Stoke Hills. Uh, Andy might uh, comment if he's had a look at the issue there. Long Garden Walk has always been a problem. That's good that that's being... So this is a good news to me very much. Faulkner Road has been done, so that's even better. It's a sort of retrospective thing. Crosby Way has been a massive problem, and I know the residents there will... I'm, I'm pretty sure they're all pleased with that. I haven't spoken to them about it in but prior to this going through, it would, um, they, they were very concerned, and uh, I hope this is going to sort it out. And St George's Road and, and Longley Road are very sensible. Um, Andy probably knows about Men and Way and Lynch Road. I don't. Um, Red Lion Lane, I don't know anything about, and I'll look into that further. I, I really don't know what's going on there. So, um, But I see that uh, Junction of Burnt Hill Road and Shawteeth Road, which is a big issue, isn't on this list. We were too late to get that in, but uh, is on the next review. P page 57 says that's going to be under the next one. So if any members here are looking at, oh, I, I want to get something into this, you can't, but look at page 57. You might be noted, noted on there. And we look forward to the advertising coming up in the uh, spring. Thank you. Red Lion Lane just walk, just drive on past the Maltings. That's it. Sorry, I know exactly where <laughs> Red Lion okay? Lane is. It's, it's an issue of but we've got to take okay, out no, a, okay, no, a, no. a sign and, and a, you know access only in order to do yeah, this. Yeah, no. And you're, uh, you're looking at the solutions. Yes, right. Mm. Um, Ms. Baker. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, looking at the schedule on page 57 of other locations assessed. Um, I would like to make a general point, actually, that um, I don't know whether I have um, been uh, uh, inattentive, but I think probably not. Uh, I see that in Godalming South, Milford and Whitley, a good proportion of these roads mentioned that are not actually proposed to have any uh, parking modifications on um, 
There's no explanation here. And indeed, I didn't know that these roads were being considered. Um, and I would just like uh, to have had some analysis and an explanation of why the ideas have been dismissed of changing the uh, parking arrangements. Um, that's the first point I'd like to make. You're going to go on? Yes. I'm also going to address the, uh, the problems of new road because it is a running sore. So if I could just have confirmation of this process, because I haven't been familiar with this before, um, Councillor Martin is proposing that double yellow should be put uh, along the end of uh, the northern end of um, New Road, outside numbers two and four, and that that can actually be modified me, in the consultation let process. Stop, let me stop you now. The process, very simply, is that anything which is put forward by a member of the public or a member of this committee goes to Jack, and Jack reviews it. Jack will tell me whether I'm talking nonsense or not as we go along. Uh, and then he brings back his views, his professional advice as to what might be done in each case. That's what we've got here. It, and he's inviting us to modify that downwards if we want to, so we can strike things off. And in a minute, I'm going to ask people at the back of the room whether they want me to chop off um, Jumps Road or not. Uh, so, but the general principle is that if there's anything that you don't want to waste his time even consulting about, then you, you say so now, and I'm sure he'd be happy to reduce his workload. But otherwise what happens is that the public then have the right to say yes or no, and he collects up the bits of paper or the emails, counts them all up, and he comes back to us with a recommendation and telling us what the balance of public view was. Yes? Is that fair? Explanation of what you do? That's pretty much it, yeah. Yep. That, so that's the system. In other words, um, I can be reassured that when I've, as I have received an email from one of the residents who tells me about a consensus amongst the residents for measures, then yes. that will be listened to by... Well, uh, uh, a resident saying that's the consensus counts one vote. Consensus is to win when 75 people out of a road of 100 say that's what we want to do. But they all have to submit to, to the consultation process. I understand perfectly, and that is very helpful, because I hope that the resident in question is listening, and if not, I'll make sure that yeah. this okay. is disseminated. Right. Okay. Yes, thank you. But you don't want to make any change right now? No. Well, do you, is there anything that you would like to take out of the consultation? That's saying you're overriding any public concern, you're saying no. As long as the public can m actually make their views known and have them taken into consideration... That, that's the purpose of the consultation. Yes, but I... I need to be absolutely certain. You've heard what I've said about the culture at county up till now. Um, well, I know that there are professionals, but I think that... Uh, look, the we, no we understand, Mrs Baker. If you don't like the way we operate, then I, I think you'd do better not to spend waste your time discussing things with us. I have to say, this is a, a setup that has worked very well over a number of years, and I, I don't see a lot of complaints about it. Mrs Coburn. Well, just to put two minds at rest, Red Line Lane is a good example of this. They had a problem, they approached us, we said, form yourselves into a residence association and then you'll have the authority to deal with Surrey on this parking issue. And it's worked. So it's up to us to inform the residents how best to use the system. And it works perfectly that way. Thank you, Jack. Peter. Can I just say, on New Road, um, I, I, I have been involved in this. It's not my proposition that we put a couple of yellow lines on the uh, outside number two and four. It's the, it's the professional recommendation by our officers. Now, in addition, uh, it, well, that goes to consultation. What you can't do during the consultation is add further items to it. So there's a, there is a thought that we could perhaps, perhaps put yellow lines on the other side of the road. You can't do that within this, this particular consultation. The proposition here is for X. You can take the consultation levels down 
as an example, if you're proposing double yellow, you could, uh, the, uh, with, 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 uh, with recommendations from the residents, they could take it down maybe to a single yellow line, which would be different, or not have it at all. But what you can't do is add to it. So what I've said to, uh, to the resident involved in, in, in reply to the letter that we received last night is to say that anything further would have to be done in the next uh, time when, when, when the restrictions are looked at. So that would, be another, that would be a year away. In my view, it is much more sensible to go very steadily and to go too much too soon is often making a position worse, not better. So what I'm, putting, what I'm suggesting, we should accept what we've got here now, try that out, and then you change it again in a future consultation. But we can't, we can't add to, we can't put in any extra thoughts right now. Okay. Chairman, may I just... Yes, I know you're getting <laughs> fed up. Time. Yeah. I'm looking at the time. I, I know, but we need the time to talk through these problems. I will be brief. Well, I think that it's a pity that there hasn't been in, enough time given so that the residents could have discussed it with the local member the before meeting. today. Well, I, I'm not aware that that's been a problem on a widespread basis, but, you know, there's a time... If you don't do it... Now, you won't get anything done this year. Right. I hear what you're It's as simple as that. <coughs> Mr Gray. I'll be, I'll be very quick because I've learnt a lot this morning on this and certainly I'll be looking at next year's review rather than doing it here. But I just want to make one point. Rural villages, I mean, they are excluded in, in a lot of things. Parking in rural villages is becoming very difficult. Very specifically, cycles. Cycling is good, isn't it? You know, we, we want people to cycle, it helps. Well, in the, my particular village, they all come in motor cars. And they put the cycles in the back and they run down. On Saturday, we had every road blocked in the village. We couldn't walk down any of our footpaths because they were there. Certainly, I like their government's uh, suggestion that they're going to enforce... Um, parking on pavements um, and that certainly is, is the case when we want that in, in, in the rural villages. My general comment on the parking review is enforcement. Um, certainly areas yeah, like that, Chitting... That's a totally different issue. Well, can I just mention, mention it and leave it and I'll shut up. Enforcement. There's not enough of it. Thank you. <laughs> the generality is that it, it, describing the problem you've got if one person puts in a description of the problem, Jack will consider it. And I, I have examples where it's been one person. But it's better if several do, because then he, he, he gets different, slightly different views, and, and it gives him some ideas about what might be possible. Now, that's the only hint I would give. So always better to have a few rather than the odd one. Um, Dr. Mogu, you're next. Very quickly, Chairman. In the listing of other locations assessed, in the paragraph at the top, it says some of them will be revisited as part of the next review, but it doesn't tell us which. That's a fair comment. Uh, my recommendation would be that, to be on the safe side, you get somebody to mention it again anyway, you know, in case people have changed their minds. You know, who knows? Yeah. Advice from the back. Jump or not? Chairman, thank you. Um, I, I'm David Crossy, I'm Chairman of Church Parish Council, and here with me is Sean Withers, Chairman of uh, French and Parish Council. If I can just brief, very briefly... No, just tell uh, me, either we, I we, withdraw we, it or I don't. We, we, we don't want to pull the, pro the, the proposal, but oh. we would like the committee to take full, and the parking team to take full account uh, of um, the technical we, we, reports. We'll have the debate at the next meeting. This is only for getting what it into the system. No more than that. Okay. So you don't want me to pull it at this stage? No. All right, fine. That's all I wanted to ask. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chairman. No, no, that was instructing me because I couldn't participate in the conversation about it because I was sitting here as the Chairman. So that's the reason for doing that. No. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm rather disappointed. My ward, um, which is Farncombe and Cattershall, and Godalming itself, suffer really badly from commuter parking. Now, we've been trying to manage commuter parking and other 
things through our car parks, changing the length of time, the cost per length of time, and the rest of it throughout Waverley. Um, talking to the portfolio holder, off street parking, we can do something about, but without some feedback into on street parking, we can't actually build a proper parking strategy. I think really it was a very bad move on Waverley's part to na not take up when it was offered the enforcement. It's now done for Surrey through Guildford and I don't think it's very effective. It would be nice, I think, if Waverley could in the future take it over because you can't do something when A, apparently there's difficulty talking to uh, both Surrey and their enforcement agents, and B, you've got no control over uh, what you can do in the off streets. Yeah. Um, I would like to ask that uh, the parking department at both Surrey and uh, Guildford would have a more joined up approach with Waverley. Thank okay. you. Well, perhaps I can help. Uh, I mean, that's not really Jack's business. Jack's business is to determine what should be done. He's not uh, an enforcement agent. Uh, Godalming, I think Godalming is probably disadvantaged to some degree because there is very little on street parking uh, in general because of the geography of Godalming. It's very limited. And so, uh, whereas uh, Farnham and Hazelmere, for example, uh, have the opportunity to have all sorts of complicated arrangements uh, where that's the most appropriate thing to do, that isn't likely to work in any scale. And it may well be mm -hmm. that consequently the uh, enforcement team spend much less time in Godalming than pro rata to the um, potential scale of the problem uh, and the size of the town, in other words, uh, than they might do elsewhere. And I think that's something that we ought to take a look at. And perhaps if you uh, leave me to talk to the Godalming members about that uh, offline, uh, we could have a look at that and see what might be done. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to comment now, Peter? Uh, well, I would just say that we had an immense consultation uh, on, on the subject. We were up uh, four or five years ago, uh, and for both Godalming North and uh, the central part of Godalming, proposals were put forward for residents parking, for instance, around the station at Foncombe, and were rejected. So um, I think it's not quite fair to say that we haven't had a very big look at this. Maybe we have to do it again, uh, but, but, and, uh, but I can recall twice... Um, when major consultations have, have happened uh, once before I became elected about 15 years ago under the time of Councillor Slashfield and Councillor Niazai, uh, and again we're under, under Steve Cosser uh, about four or five years ago and myself. Yeah, so it, it, we have had two substantial uh, reviews. And maybe it's time to do it again, but it's not been without effort in the past. Is that okay? I would say that the usage of cars has probably doubled since that last one was done five years ago, and certainly the building has. I look actually at the areas around the stations at Milford and at Farncom, and I believe Network Rail actually own land there that they let out to businesses. I would like to see Network Rail take responsibility for commuter parking much more than they do. But that's by the by. Well, yeah, I would, I mean, welcome, that, I would that, welcome another and survey. And to be quite frank, that, that's actually a Waverley issue because it would be off-street parking and planning related issues. And, and I, I think Waverley might well want to look into that uh, rather than getting the county involved. It's strictly on-street parking that we deal with at county level. Uh, obviously, we do it through this committee, but, but uh, it, does that make sense? Yeah, okay, thank you. Yes, Ms. McLeod. <coughs> Thanks, Jim. Just a couple of quick comments. Uh, I'd just like to say I'm happy with what's happening in terms of my area. Um, I'll just say for Christine benefit, it's actually a, a, a fainting bridge type of process, this, that as soon as one of these things finishes, the next one starts, and you need to be talking to Jack Roberts about the next one, because all these concerns, you can't do much about what's happening now. You've got to be feeding into the next one. Um, in terms of, I'd make a comment briefly about Waverley and, and uh, enforcement. The, the current Waverley executive would prefer to do the enforcement ourselves, but there is a, 
a contract in place with Guildford. It's a contract between right. Surrey and Guildford, actually. There is now, yeah. It's got two or three years to go. So we'll, we'll look at that again when that contract expires. It'd be far better if, 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 if Waverley did it. But we can't do anything about it for the next two or three years. Well, from a Surrey point of view, that depends on the deal that Waverley offers. Yes. Because, and, and you would be particularly interested in that with your Farnham representative colleagues because of the effect of the Farnham surplus, um, because of the efficiency of the arrangements with, that currently exist. So be careful. <laughs> the the Guildford officers are quite efficient. You know, they, they don't do a bad job, yeah. but it'd be far better if it was done by Waverley. Mr Chairman, can I just draw your attention? You, you sort of cut me off when I mentioned enforcement, and we've just had a ten-minute discussion on it. Yeah, Thank well, you. Touché. Touché. Right. So now uh, we've reached a point where I, I need you to agree or not agree to uh, sorry okay. to agree or not agree to the um, proposal that the proposals that uh, the parking team have put forward should be put out to uh, to um, con public consultation uh, in accordance with the resolutions recommendations which you find on page forty nine. Do we need to take each one separately? Yeah. Okay, right. Take so we one, need. Two, so we first of all take little one. So, uh, as, as de amendments as described, they agreed. Don't have to vote. Just so okay. yeah. All right, just agree them. Yeah, and that funding uh, should be as proposed up to the maximum defined. Is that agreed? Agreed. So, and that the intentions of the county council to make an order, uh, as shown according to the drawings. Uh, would be subject, of course, to the effects of the public consultation. Is that agreed? Agreed. And if there are any unresolved objections, after, because what happens then is there are objections, they're considered, and if agreement can't be reached, then um, they would go uh, by uh, in accordance with the uh, County Council's scheme of delegation for these matters to the appropriate officers. Is that agreed? Agreed. That's what that's saying. But with the consultation with Victoria and or myself, and the local county councillor. Okay. Thank you very much. That uh, deals with item 11. So item 12, uh, Mr. Apicella. Do you like to introduce? Thank you, Chairman. I will be brief. Um, hopefully you will have the opportunity to read the report. Um, the report details this year's or this coming financial year's county allocation to the county members and I have already met with seven of the nine county members and we have discussed how and what we will be expending the finances on. Um, I'm due to meet with Stephen shortly. Uh, Peter, I would urge you to um, arrange that so that we can um, be ahead of the game this year because it's very early this year and um, I would like to try and make sure that all the money is at least allocated um, by October as per the Cabinet members' recommendations so that uh, none of the money goes back or is lost. Um, there is one mistake I've made in the paper. Um, that the, the, the numbers are correct apart from the uh, numbers that make it up. So in Table 2.211, paragraph 2.211 on page 96, um, the table there the percentages are supposed to be 72% and 28% respectively, and I have mistakenly put the 72 and the 28 as thousands. That should read 66240 for the first one in lieu of the 72, and in lieu of the 28, it should read 25760, but the 92,000 is correct. Sorry? 66 1,240 pounds, and the second one, 25,760. Um, so yes, apart from that, and the, the, the only recommendation really for resolution, apart from the finances, is the approval to advertise the scheme which is shown in the Annex 3, I think, which is the um, pedestrian crossing outside the school and the associated works um, in Warmer Hill. So, thank you. Okay. Mr. Hyde. 
I did, did uh, spot that one at 2.2.11, but I wonder whether, uh, Frank, did you, did you also, um, at 2.15, on page 94, there's a table there, which I think actually should be in the previous paragraph. I, this confused me no end, because it says county councillors continue to be given a revenue highway fund allocation at seven and a half grand. And then it's the table, it's of capital, and of course it's absolutely nothing to do with seven and a half grand a member. It's to do with the three million pound that we've got in the capital allowance, isn't it? And all the rest of it, so which rather. And it also has Guildford in bold, which makes me think that this one actually you copied from a Guildford. Um, the that's the thing. county, that's all Is 11. It? That's the breakdown from all the That's how you build up the three million across yeah. all 11 districts. That's right, which applies to 214. It doesn't really apply to 215, it, it, it does. if you it know what be. I mean. Yes, that it, says it, should, it, should have, it should have shown as part of 2.14. Uh, I, I wondered also at 2.2.1, 2, 2 .2 on page 95, um, it says that at the informal meeting of the local committee held on 31st of January, a programme of works was recommended for approval. I thought that was a children's services meeting that I came to. I wasn't, I, I, I may have forgotten or missed or something like that, but um, I don't know whether we have actually agreed it was, um, it was a, um, an informal meeting where I went through this um, with these figures. I presented these figures to the informal, and they recommended that those figures come to this meeting today for ratification. Okay, thanks. Right, I thought what you were saying we'd been agreed to something, and I didn't remember having um, done that, because that was a, a children's services meeting, I think, wasn't it, on the 31st that we had? Um, I couldn't be sure of that. Um, the, um, under the customer services, uh, 2.3, I think it's, it's um, good news that we've got uh, the number of com uh, inquiries on highway matters has gone down 14%. That's great. Um, let me see what, uh, what other notes I'd, I'd made of that. Uh, local, yeah, page 98, I've referred to already the local transport strategy from 2.9.6 to 2.9.9. The only important thing that I'd uh, consider there is that we, we do have to start from where we are, not from some imaginary position in the past or in the future. Um, we, we, we have to start from uh, you know, the situation we've got and the law as it stands, rather than uh, what we might like to um, uh, to. to, to somewhere else we might like to start from. Um, of course, the, you know, the issue here, in, in my mind, is the folly of planning without first assessing the consequences of our actions, which is, you know, what goes on all the time, and it's what I've been banging on about in respect of uh, the um, Royal Deer Junction for the past 15 or 20 years. You know, we have got to assess the consequences of our actions before we do this stuff. Um, I remember when a, a, a lady, Councillor Lee, I think her name was, and I think she represented Hindhead. Uh, she was a councillor for a four-year period, but, uh, probably from tw 2011 to 15 or something like that. And she told us about St Albans, where they had put in a new pedestrianisation scheme with a, uh, a new road system, costing an awful lot of money to put it in. And it gridlocked the whole place, and they had to pay an awful lot of money to take it out and put it back as it had been before. And I don't know whether they've um, sorted that out by now, uh, but we certainly don't want to be making that mistake. And we certainly haven't got the we haven't got the money to be able to undo a big mistake if we allow Cress McNicholson to do it this autumn. So that's why I bang on about the um, you know 120 million pounds um, big mistake we may be making there. Thank I you, don't Chairman. Know, I don't know who you're talking about, actually. I've lived in Hyde. Nikki years. Lee, who was a doctor, lady, was a councillor here. She's given an example of some Yes. She was a borough councillor, and she told us. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, I should have said she wasn't a county councillor. She okay. was a, she was no, no, a councillor, I, though. No, I can't remember the pedestrianisation out at St Albans. I think it was St Albans that she... Uh, the, but it's it Sir Hertfordshire or up that way Oh, that I see. So, oh, about. you mean St Albans City? See, our church is called St Albans in Hindhead. Yeah. That's, I was confused. I, I I'm sorry, pardon. I didn't know that. I, I, I beg your pardon. I should uh, read up I better on your church. The, 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 meeting, the reason that you, you talked about uh, the 31st of January, there was an item, first of all, where Mary Lewis came and talked to us about the children's service. So we did have a discussion about the children's service. So you, you, your memory is not at fault. Uh, uh, but, but we actually did the other thing as well. Okay. I think that's what happened. Thank yeah. you. Yes, Mr McLeod. Just a general question to Frank. Uh, the, the new Chancellor and all this money is going to spend on in infrastructure. I, I remember him mentioning specifically he was going to spend millions and millions of pounds to repair millions and millions of potholes. When, when do we see this 
coming down to Surrey <laughs> and having an effect on the ground. Have you any thoughts on that, Frank? It's probably an unfair question to I will ask wait you. to see it in my budget. <laughs> Fair enough. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit sad, really, isn't it? When, when we've really got people's mind around the fact that it's not the, you know, the potholes we need to fix, it's the roads. That we've got to that point, we want to spend a lot of money on capital investment, capital maintenance works, you know, major works, uh, rebuilding the roads, and, and, and Rishi wants to spend it on fixing the potholes. Well, there you go. Say I love you. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Um, Frank and I had some really frank discussions about uh, some of these numbers prior to the meeting. Something I think I'd like to emphasise that I learned from that and, and, and was something I hadn't fully appreciated, and thanks to Frank for doing that, is if you draw your attention to 2.2, the section called Capital, in, in particular the paragraphs 2.2.3 and 2.2.4, you'll have spotted that the, the, each division is going to get 23,456 of... Um, capital funding, what you might not have spotted is there is a separate amount of 95,000, that's the 100 less the 5, which equates to 10,555 per division for capital maintenance. And I think that distinction between capital and capital maintenance is a new one to us this year compared to, say, last. already spoken with, uh, with Wyatt, and oh, that, okay. that, that oh. is the case. Yes, oh, you've he had the conversation. Was, he was okay. clarifying, yes. Yeah, yeah. We've had that conversation. Yeah. I want to uh, speak as an accountant that's familiar with the difference between revenue and capital and some of these different categories. I wanted to point out to my colleagues that we seem to have this extra segregation within our different buckets that we can go for for funds. Yeah. Do you want me to know? Yeah, I have, I have been explaining that to the, to the members individually at, uh, at the one-to-ones exactly what that financial allocation can and cannot be spent on. So I've, I've made that, um, that identification here in the paper, but I've also been doing it um, on a one-to-one -one basis in explaining that. Could, could I just ask you, at the beginning, before this meeting started, Mrs Barton and I agreed that we would share the cost of some works, uh, in, on all that, which is shared piece of road. Oh. Uh, how is that going to be funded? Once I get the quote back um, and you're happy with the quote, it will be funded equally between you. If you're happy with that, equal. What I meant was that which fund? Which pot? Which pot? That would be um, any of those. It, it, it could be spent out of okay, so we, the, the we 23 and later. the 10 and a half combined, yeah, okay. if you want it to. Well, yes. It won't be that much. <laughs> okay, we'll deal with that in due course. Any, anybody want to raise anything else? Or can we move to recommendations, please? Uh, recommendations. Ninety-four. Uh, Ninety-three. I mean, page ninety-three. The first one. No, sorry. Page ninety-three. The first one is uh, noting the approved allocations uh, so far. Works progressed in the current year. Is that agreed? We agree. Right. Then approving the recommendations for utilising the, the available budget. Is that agreed? Agreed. Uh, to approve the uh, arrangements outside Woolmer Hill School. Is that agreed? Agreed. And to delegate to the area highway manager in, consult in consultation with Victoria, myself, and whoever's the uh, relevant divisional member to deal with any problems that, uh, as they arise. Is that agreed? Thank you very much. So that takes us on to item... Uh, Just for information that Matt Furness wanted to oh, bring. Right, okay, so item 13 was purely a matter of information. If anybody wanted to raise any points arising, could I suggest that they, uh, they email Matt Furness directly? I think that's probably the best thing to, to say about it's that. It's going to come that, every time. It, oh, I see, it's going to be a regular item, is it? Yes. Every time. Oh, okay. Well, I suppose it's useful that we, we see it. Perhaps uh, on an occasion when we have more time, we might have a closer look at what, what he, he's put onto that item. But uh, I think we should proceed as, as we are now. Yes, why? Perhaps we could bring it forward in the agenda, Mr Chairman, <laughs> given the, the way we feel at this stage in the meeting, usually. Yeah, Yvette. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Point noted. Thank you very much. Um, and then we have the uh, standard decision tracker. Are there any uh, comments on the on the tracker? It's pages 115, 116. The chairman, just uh, uh, page 116, the vehicle activated signs uh, in Portsmouth Road, which uh, we had a lady come and uh, member of the public come and speak to us about that at our last meeting, and uh, I'm sure that. Uh, um, the, the local members are keeping track of it, but it does say that it's going to be done by the end of March, and I'm um, just wondering whether that's on target or not. Perhaps Peter knows more. Thanks. Yes, Peter. Yes, I have been in touch. Um, they are on order. They take four to six weeks to be um, got ready and so on and so forth, and it will be done in early April now. And they're, so not, and they're not manufactured in China? Sorry? They're not manufactured in China? Oh, well, uh, I haven't been told they are, but they are on order, um, and, and I am told that they will be installed in April. Okay, jolly good. Thank you very much. Anything else on that item, decision tracker? No? And then on page 117, you have the forward programme as proposed. Forward yes, Andrew. In the meeting, uh, the chairman suddenly announced that we were only going to have three meetings a year. Yes. And uh, I think it seemed to go by without uh, comment, and I think people were not prepared for the announcement, uh, as none of us had been forewarned, as far as I know. It seemed to me the only place I could raise it uh, subsequently was under the forward programme. So uh, why are we being reduced? Uh, where's the consultation been with members? Um, you know, could we have a little bit more explanation and what's our opportunity to uh, uh, argue? <laughs> and if you wanted to put the Vice Chairman of this committee on the spot, you could say, and is that good, good governance? <laughs> I, 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 it's the first I'd heard of it, so I, I, I'm in no position to comment. Yvette? I don't know all the information, but it was something that Victoria agreed and it's something that's been introduced across all 11 boroughs and districts. Peter? Oh, Has there been any consultation with members? I'd have to get back to you on that. I'm sorry, Andrew. I think that's unsatisfactory, and it's a shame Victoria's not here, but perhaps she could take back our displeasure, or my displeasure, if other members agree as well, uh, something like that being okay. done without consultation. Well, not entirely, actually, because at the same meeting where Mary Lewis talked to us about the children's service, we had another presentation from James Painter at which he included this item, Frank reminds me. And, and there, wasn't, there was a sort of mm, sort of reaction, but nothing specific. And I guess that's because nobody had heard of it, anything about it before and they wanted to go away and think about it. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a fair point. And uh, go on, Peter, what are you going to say? Um, well, I have to say, I don't recall that. I mean, he may have said that, but if he'd said that, I certainly didn't absorb it. We've had four meetings a year for as long as I can remember, traditionally in March, June, September and December. That's been the format. Um, and uh, reducing, I mean, we have difficulty uh, discharging our responsibilities on the basis of four meetings in the relevant time. Trying to reduce that to three meetings, I think, would be... Um, Surprising. So if we missed it, um, I'm sorry, I missed it. Uh, um, I have to say I'd register the fact that I'm not happy with the proposition. We should only have three meetings. I think that's perhaps something that the county members uh, ought to take up with their relevant group leaders for um, a bit further discussion. Yes? Happy with that? Yeah? No? Nick, no? Nikki? My concern is this is all sort of um, a slow drift to us having no input at all because I've heard the partnership boards going forwards probably won't even have any um, member representation on them and decisions about highways etc will be taken um, by these partnership boards without our involvement so my concern deep concern is that gradually we're being phased out and this is all part of the, the process so I am very concerned thank you. I'd like to, to propose, Chairman, so it's not lost to the nucleus of this group and, and everybody that's on it, that instead of taking it away only, as well as taking it away and talking to our different groups, that we put an item on the agenda for the future to actually raise the debate and have a debate in public as to why we're not having four meetings per year rather than the three. OK. Well, uh, there's no reason why you shouldn't put on the uh, forward programme uh, an item... Uh, for discussion of the number of meetings held each year and when. 
I mean, yeah, actually, there is an argument for saying that the September and December ones, for the purposes of dealing with what most people in, in Waverley are most interested in, which is the roads, um, doesn't necessarily work very well from a timing point of view. So as well as numbers, you might also consider the, the exact timings to get the best value out of, the, of what we do. That, uh, that would be a comment I would make. Yeah. I would support that. Point. Okay, so are we agreed that we'll put that down for the... For the uh, future. 19th of June is the next meeting. 19th month. of June is the next meeting, if you'd like to make sure that you're aware of that. Yeah. That, that's, what, that's what we've just agreed to do. Mm. And <laughs> yeah, the beginning of you. Mm. Well, actually, it's quite difficult to have the, uh, the future programme other than at the end. But, but also, uh, who would? We, I mean, the, we need the important people, thing yeah. is that it's there mm. on paper. Yeah, but also we need somebody at a very high level who's going to come and speak to that item, rather than a discussion amongst ourselves that we're not happy with. Well, that. I, I think in the first instance we ought to be talking to our, uh, our political groups, uh, and uh, you know, I'll, I'll speak to Robert. <laughs> and, the, and where's the 25 percent saving going then? What we're spending? <laughs> what's the money being spent? Well, <laughs> but it well, is. It's more a matter might, of democracy. You might first of all it's ask whether it's saving the money at all. That's the separate. Uh, you know, th there's a number of issues. There. Yep. But I think what we need to do is, if if we talk to to the people who uh, presumably have agreed this amongst themselves, uh, then we can move on from there. And there, I think there there may be pressures to do with, uh, as, as Nikki was pointing out. I don't know whether the joint committees have have instigated this because it might suit Woking I don't know if he was here we could ask him uh, be, because of the nature of those places where they have joint committees they tend to be much more urban and they may feel they can do their business better in other ways I don't know uh, but it may be just because of the move towards the uh, the overarching committees we'll see but at least let's raise it yes Wyatt uh, separate item, um, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, we seem to have lost from the forward programme, but maybe there's a separate pro forward programme for the informal meetings, which was the briefing session on the difference between a joint committee and a local committee. Because we were at one stage being encouraged to try and see if we should move to a joint committee. Now, we've had a presentation, a very woolly general up in the air one, about the partnership board. But the partnership board is not a joint committee. What some of us were saying is, well, let's educate us first, please, on the difference between the two variants of the model that we've already got going in the, the county, which is the difference between local and joint. Yeah, sure. And, and okay. it seems to have been uh, it, it, knocked you, out. You were right at the beginning when you said it may have been for a meeting in private. So that, and the reason was so that people could be candid about their views. Right. And uh, I, I would prefer to have discuss such a thing in, in an inform, informal meeting, in private, yeah. because I have quite strong views on the subject. So that's on the list, the equivalent list, well, for I the informal meeting. I guess it would be on Yvette's list of items to, to come forward sometime. Do you have any plans? Um, it's something that our team is discussing with all districts and boroughs at the moment. But I think it's being led by um, the leader... So um, Maybe. I think it might be a, of, of whether we have joint committees. Sorry, I, I don't, I, I'm not privy to all the information, but um, I think it's been led by the leader, the reduction in number of meetings and whether we move to a joint committee. And we would, we just, I think Victoria agreed at a previous meeting, we wouldn't have it on the agenda, uh, the, uh, sorry, the forward plan, because this is for formals and that we would discuss it at an informal. And I will take that back to my team managers and say that that's what you want to discuss. I'm not wanting particular discussion. I'm looking forward to some education on how a joint committee differs from a local committee. Once everybody in this room, or is, should be, it could be in this room, knows what the difference is between the two, we can then debate it. I suspect at the moment we've got experts on one, because that's what we do, and some of us have had a, a slight Involvement in the other. So, actually, that's not me. So well, that's why I want to be educated. The, the, I want a I mean, joint committee. The, at a, a simplistic level, the, the difference is that at a joint committee, half the agenda is to do with the district or borough council, as the case may be, and 
involved in, allows county councillors to be involved in the um, allocation of resources, if I put it as loosely as that, in the same way that the Waverley councillors here uh, are entitled to be involved in the allocation of resources on county matters. Uh, and in Waverley, that's where the idea of joint committee has broken down two or three times over the last 20 years, um, because Waverley was never very happy with that situation and, and wanted to make sure it had control of its own shop. So it's understandable, in my view. My own take in the matter is that these committee meetings actually proved to be very popular with both the public and the public take part in them. I think that the public interest would say that we are successful as we are, and I would doubt very much if we could improve on that. Mm. Well, I'll probably agree with you. <laughs> anyway, it's a, it's, a, it's a matter for discussion. But Okay, uh, nothing else is on the agenda, so I declare the meeting closed. Uh, if the, unless, am I wrong about that? Did I miss anything? I don't think so. No, it's a, if the, whoever's left from Farnham, like. There's the three county, county councillors. Okay, and, I, and Jerry, Jeremy, Jerry's here. So Mark's gone, and somebody else has gone. Oh, Carol's gone. Yeah, Mark and Carol have gone. That's what's happened. Yeah.